Board of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee meeting of May 22nd, 2012. Uh, thank you everybody for coming and thank you Amherst Media for bringing this to people at home. Uh, first, agenda review. Um, one thing I'd like to add to the agenda is during the um, superintendent's update is we have a consultant here to explain to us the, the move from, of the retired teachers' health insurance from the group insurance commissioner, GIC, back to the local health care trust fund. So he'll briefly uh, explain what that is to us and answer any questions. Um, any other comments on the agenda? Yes. Oh, no, I just have a comment. I mean, I announced it. Okay, <laughs> um, Next is approval of minutes of May 8, 2012. Any corrections to those? Uh, Michael. One quick one. Uh, in 1B, I think Kip has got the wrong gender attached to his name. You're a Ms. <laughs> <you're a Ms. laughs> <laughs> Any other corrections? Okay, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes. I move to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, great. Uh, moving on to announcements and public comment. Anyone having uh, public comment to make can come forward to the microphone, state your name. Uh, please keep your comments to around two minutes and we don't allow comments about any specific school employees, so I try to refrain from that. If I only use one, can I donate another minute to someone else? I'm joking. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, my name is uh, Dave Noonan, 32 Tanglewood Road, and this is a question uh, concerning the late start. And um, uh, I'd like to know what type of uh, s real studies you folks have done to see what type of uh, impact you will have on parents' employment by forcing them to stay an hour, 45 minutes or uh, later in the home before they can go to work. I know there was some type of study uh, done amongst people um, who were, uh, I don't know what the term is, uh, receiving some type of uh, stipend or something for schools. But the vast majority of people, to my knowledge, and I, in the vast majority, I think. Uh, no one ever questioned me. No one, to my knowledge, has any scientific study about whether or not people are going to have to um, uh, somehow give something back to their employer or lose something uh, by way of wages or benefits because they have to stay X number of minutes longer in the house to see their kids out. And I would ask you that I really don't think you should be voting on something like that unless you know, especially in these days and times where dollars are real important to people and if you're going to affect their ability to make dollars, um, you, you need to know that simultaneously. I know all the studies about how it may help the kids. You have a concomitant obligation to make sure the, the benefit you render for the kids is not offset by the harm that you render to the parents. And that's all. Sure. Any other comments? Yeah. Hi, my name is Kelly Knight. I've been a bit of a, a school time stalker. <laughs> I followed around to a few of the different forums and um, have participate, not participated, uh, listened to your discussions. Um, I have many minutes, I won't use David's, um, to talk about this, but I am very, very concerned as a district about what these decisions have uh, with regard to impact on the families in our community. Um, I think that uh, at our last meeting, Mr. Shabazz talked about what is the impact on elementary schools, and the concern I had is that we have this change that will affect parts of the schools that um, haven't had identified problems. So I'm a terrible public speaker. I'm going to get better. <laughs> I'm a great heckler. So <laughs> she might have known. Um, so the issue is, uh, for me, the cost benefit. And to determine that, we have to identify what the problem is. Um, and I think that what we've identified in this community is what the solution is before identifying what the problem is. So the question for me has been, what is it that we're trying to solve? Who are we trying to benefit? What is the, 
the issue that we're trying to cure for the students and which students. Um, and I don't know that we've really talked about that. We've talked about depression, we've talked about mental health, we've talked about sleep cycles, we've talked about lots of issues and then the secondary problems of this change. But what is it that we're trying to improve? And I would like to have some real discussion around that. With regard to elementary students, I think we're causing a problem, personally. I think we're adding to their day. We're increasing the cost for the middle class. With regard to um, uh, increasing time for after school care, I think that kids will be in care, either beginning or ending of the day, for longer periods of time. Um, I think that uh, some of the research that we've talked about, I'm not going to go in order because I've been perseverating on this and uh, chewing on my issues, so I'm going to just float them out. Uh, with regard to the other studies, they talk about um, districts that don't have bus schedules that are attached. And I think this committee has to really consider that the hour and 15 minutes actually makes sense only fiscally. It's not really ideal. And so do we want to have a non-ideal solution for the questionable problem? Um, I think that everybody would agree that an hour and 15 minutes is actually a long change, not the ideal change for the secondary school. Um, pushing it, the exit of school to 3.30 in the afternoon or 3.25 really shifts everything, that our late buses will be leaving school after 5 o'clock, that our sports schedules will end up being later in the evening. Um, there is a protective factor that I think has been well established around families spending dinner times together, evenings together, going uh, to bed at similar hours, having similar schedules. That can't be supported with a start time change. Um, and I know my minutes are up. Um, uh, the other concern I really have is about sports. We have a huge participation of sports in this district between 42 and 50 percent, I think um, Mr. Farrell could tell us, uh, per trimester of our secondary st students participate in sports with a very high eligibility criteria for GPA. In two of the three trimesters, if you only participate in one sport, it's a really significant safety net. And what I'd like to know is what percentage of the demographic that we're trying to hit participate in sports at that rate and how many semesters or trimesters so that we actually know who are we making this huge change for? Are we hitting that mark? And is this what we want to have the cost benefit to weigh out on? Okay. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Nat Woodruff, and I'm a teacher at the high school as well as the Nordic coach. And I'm just here to kind of give my perspective on how I think that the delayed start to school is going to take away some opportunities from our kids. Um, I think taking away an hour at the end of the day is an hour of opportunity that these kids have. And I don't think that there will be added opportunities at the beginning of the day that will be the equivalent to what's lost. Our sport in particular is one that practices during the winter time and we rely on a just a little window of daylight that we have at from currently when school ends um, until the sun goes down so we have an hour and with this change in start time we're really looking at losing all of our sun. Um, I think that uh, <coughs> Rich Farrow gave you guys a really good summary of how this is going to affect sports teams. Ours is one that I'll just say that it could go away. Um, without being able to practice after school, we won't have a team. I mean, we won't be able to train the kids, and it wouldn't be fair to just put them in on a meet on Saturday if we're not training them during the week. So, um, And before school, because we practice off-site, it's going to be very difficult. So, so this could be one of those things that goes away, and I imagine that there's other things out there that will suffer similarly to our sport. Cool. Um, uh, yep, so um, that's my perspective. Thank you. Any other comments? Hi, I'm Kevin Landau, uh, 17 Gulf Road in Pelham. Uh, I would like just to add a little bit more of a comment about the sports concern. Um, my concern is that if we go ahead and, and make our time change and other schools don't, it's just going to be one huge chaotic uh, scheduling debacle for scheduling games and uh, you know having our, our school system 
uh, unilaterally making a change without other school systems following seems like it would just add to the confusion. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Lena Quackenbush. I'm a junior currently at the high school, and I know my coach already came up and was talking about how the later start times will affect the ski team. But some of my fellow teammates and I are here, and we wanted to really say how much the ski team has meant to us and the fact that it's only been here for four years, and this year they've already had to put a cap on it because so many kids wanted to be on it. It seems like it would be a major shame if we lost it by getting having start times later. And also when I was planning on coming here to talk, I was asking some of my teammates, you know, what do they feel about it? And they were saying, you know, after going out and practicing for two hard hours or more a day, you're already tired when you get home at eight o'clock. And so the end do then do homework, you want to go to bed as soon as you can. So these pushing back start times would actually just make us have less like exercise and therefore would maybe harm us even more than the benefit of later start times. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Okay, any comments from the school committee members? Did you have one, Catherine? No. All right, uh, moving on to superintendent. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, didn't, I thought you okay. might want me to come in here. No, I do have an announcement. Okay. Um, that the Regional School District Planning Committee is having a public forum on Thursday night at 7 o'clock at the Amherst Media Studios, um, at which time uh, Stephen Hemmen, who is uh, part of the Massachusetts uh, Regional Massachusetts Association of Regional Thank you, Michael. <laughs> um, it's been a long day. Um, uh, we'll be there to answer uh, Amherst-specific questions and questions that came up at our first public <coughs> forum. And uh, so I really encourage people to come and uh, get some of their questions answered at that time and inform the committee about things that they want us to um, carry forward. Thanks. Any I'm other? sorry, I have another comment. I asked a question expecting that I would get a response. Is this not the forum where no, I get the response? Yes. Another day? Sorry, I should have mentioned, but we don't respond to public comments. However, when we get to that item on the agenda, we'll certainly keep what you said in mind and talk about it at that time. Any other comments? What was the date again? Sorry? It's the date the 24th. This Thursday. This coming what Thursday. Time is the 24th at 7 o'clock. Okay. At the Amherst Media Studios. Um, moving on to superintendent's update. Okay, so um, given that we have a very uh, large agenda and we have Ken with us um, tonight to talk about uh, the potential of having our retired teachers move from the GIC back to the town's um, health insurance plan, I thought it would be helpful if I just gave you the, these to read and people can look on our website for the updates. Um, there's lots of great updates in here and I would love to speak to them, but I know time is limited. So I'd love to introduce um, Ken Lombardi, who's here and again from EBS Foreign. I said that correctly. Um, thank you. And so <coughs> Ken advises the town and in this case the schools related to um, our health matters, health insurance matters. And Kathy Mazur is here as well and I believe Kay's Logar just walked in as well. So, so um, perfect timing Kay. So if Ken, I think he'd like to share some information with us, allow us to ask some questions and this is just kind of the first information sharing around this topic. So. Um, Ken, you can use the microphone. You could sit if you sure. prefer and just take it off of there, whatever is comfortable for you. But if I just stand here. Is that Perfect. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you, uh, Maria, for uh, explaining all this information. So I believe you folks have received a package of information about what the subject is all about. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a sensitive issue because it deals with retiree health insurance. But I think what we're uh, trying to explain is that for a, a chance, we have a, uh, an opportunity to actually improve benefits for the retirees and lower cost. And, We've been studying this issue for quite some time, and we, we've reached that pinnacle, if you will, where this does make sense to follow through with the process. So to kind of frame this, um, to make it simple to understand, there's 288 teachers that are retired from the school district whose health insurance is provided through the State Group Insurance Commission, which is the 
uh, largest health insurance purchasing group here in Massachusetts. Municipalities can also offer retiree health insurance, and they typically do that by themselves on a direct basis. And the health care trust fund does cover town retirees as well at this point in time. Um, what we've uncovered is that with the rising cost of health insurance uh, through the Group Insurance Commission and the frequent uh, changes in health insurance plans that our local health care plan options through the health care trust fund, Amherst, Pelham, and the school district that it's part of that, actually does show that retirees on average will save premium and in increase their benefits. So to frame this, there's 288 folks that are in question. So when you meet to review this uh, in uh, the public forum, those folks have been invited to attend the hearing and hear information. Um, I'm aware that Kathy and, and Kay, the folks that are managing this, have provided those retirees with frequently asked questions and lots of information. None of it's going to make any sense to retirees, and it's likely that during this session we'll be able to hopefully explain what we're trying to accomplish. Um, to further analyze this, out of the 288, I have to split it into really two groups of retirees, and the reason for that is because Mass Law treats retirees that are 65 and older differently than early retirees or retirees that aren't entitled to Medicare. Um, there's 162 out of the 288 that are Medicare entitled. So what that means is when they turned 65, they went to Social Security and they applied to Medicare and they were provided with hospital services and medical services at a premium. Um, that was a requirement by the state in order to continue health insurance. All of these 162 retirees that have Medicare will see a premium reduction in a benefits improvement. So I'm, I'm confident and I'm pleased to be able to report that for a change, we'll have a group of retirees after they get done yelling and screaming at us, will likely see that, yeah, this is a pretty good deal. And more importantly, there is no loss of provider network coverage. So that's very critical to understand. And the reason for that is because all of the health plans, state provided, local provided, require that the employee, the retiree, excuse me, has Medicare as primary, and then therefore they use a provider that accepts Medicare. So there's no difference in the protocols, the processes, the utilization. It's all entirely the same. Plan names will be different, and we'll understand that, and folks will think we're taking their health insurance, but we're replacing it with a plan that is actually better in benefits and low in premium. So that's a win-win. So we're, we're pleased uh, to be able to explain that to that part of the membership. The other remaining 160 or so folks out of the 288, actually 106, excuse me, um, they fall into a number of categories. Under the state GIC, retired teachers have limited plan options. There's actually a whole mess of plan options for the GIC, but for some quirky reason, the GIC permits the retired teachers, uh, only allows them to uh, uh, enroll in a handful of plans. And some of these are very expensive. Um, we do have locally plan options that are similar some are either the same cost or slightly higher, but all of the plans that we're going to be switching these folks to have much improved benefits. So the, the cost benefit lies uh, with the member, uh, and obviously they'll enjoy uh, at the end of the year after their out-of-pocket expenses, will enjoy lower overall costs. Some of these folks have, will now have more plan options, and they may actually have lower premiums as well as improved benefits. A little bit of a complicated issue because we are changing, of course, the health care plans. Um, but again, the same issue with these non-Medicare retirees. They'll be using providers that they have access to today. There's no restrictions. There's actually some more expansive coverage. Service areas aren't required. We have some local HMOs that have actually have more robust networks. They may actually find their providers in these networks. So we generally think we have you know one size fits all and everyone should benefit from this. I've been involved with this process in other communities, and I don't have to tell you that clearly. This is a, um, with the age population and the, uh, their likelihood to not really understand all this, you know, we, we have a, a focused effort in trying to work with these folks, if one-on-one, -on -one, if we have to, to try and make sure that this transition is smooth. Another important detail is when your active employees retire, there'll be continuity into benefit plans because right now, when they do retire, we disrupt the whole process and we make them change their current plan arrangements and now they have to go into other plans as well. Um, and then the biggest issue here is obviously the net savings to the district. There's, there's less premium through this mechanism than through the cherry sheet allocation from the GIC premium payments. We can control our plan designs where we don't have that control through the GIC. 
all of the members will see improved benefits. And I think this is the age category that likely uh, will in, you know, experience the, the, the better benefit. Our younger active employees don't have the same claims cost, but these members uh, have frequent use. You know, specifically, the prescription drug benefit is vastly improved, and of all of the benefits used, that's where the membership, you know, spends most of their dollars. It's not that easy as just saying, yeah, we're going to do it, and it rolls out. I've been in, as I said, I've been involved in the process. Uh, it's a little bit of hand-to-hand -hand combat, but at the end of the day, very confident that the members will see that there's a lot of value in this recommendation. So... Can you read questions? Maria. Yeah, before we go to questions, too. So this information Ken needs to share with us now. The process is Kathy and Kay have shared information with all of the retirees with the question and answer, um, more than willing to sit individually with people because it's, it is a complicated process to walk through. This would require, then, a public forum, yes. which I believe we have June 13th where we will need to have school committee members as well as um, from select boards from and select the boards from the town of Pelham and the town of Amherst, thank you, um, to come and hear questions and concerns from the retirees because ultimately the school committee will have to vote as to whether to make this move or not. So we need to be really informed and we need to be able to help people walk through the process so that we are, have full consideration before a vote comes to us. Um, so I just wanted to make sure people under kind of understood the process. Yeah, Marie's uh, point is that you three boards are the respective insurance authorities for purchasing health insurance. Thank you. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to thank you um, and Kathy and for putting all of this together. I thought that the uh, material that you sent out was really very informative. But I do have two concerns. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, one is um, I, I have a feeling that retired people, next to mm -hmm. knowing their grandchildren. Um, I try to keep up as much as possible with health care. Mm -hmm. And um, several of your comments concern me. Okay. And I would hope that um, during the forum, you would not speak down to people who attend this forum. Um, they, they may actually know more about the health system than you do, because it's so close to them, much more so than when you're 25. Um, that's one point. Second point is uh, a number of these people are going to be quite old. And I'm wondering if any um, effort has been made to provide transportation for the meeting on the 13th. We have not made an effort at this point. It's a good suggestion, and we can reach out and see if, if that would be helpful to some people. Uh, it is being televised live, um, this forum, so it will go to people's uh, homes who live in the area. Um, we're also providing some assistive devices for people who may have some um, you know, challenges that would impair their ability to fully participate in the forum. Full participation to me means being there. So I would just like to see you make an extra effort to provide yep. Understood. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other quick questions yet, Lawrence? <coughs> I don't know if this is the, the, the forum to do this, but just a couple of questions. Uh, so the plan that retirees, or the plans that retirees are being encouraged to move into, has there been stability in the premiums and the yeah quite honestly over the last two or three years we've had hardly any rate adjustments or and or plan design changes actually okay and our plans are very competitive in fact they're lower cost than the group insurance commission plans at this point well and that that leads to another question when they make the move is there stability for a year how do and the reason i ask that is because as everyone knows who's been following the, the discussions about moving municipal employees into, uh, well, into the GIC and other plans, the folks at Pittsfield, when they made the move into uh, to the GIC, were all of a sudden shocked to find sure. out in mid-cycle that they had a hike in uh, co-pays and other costs. And uh, I'm just one, curious. Yeah, one of our biggest concerns is there's front-end deductibles on some of the benefit plans that your retirees are paying, yep. and we don't have those in the health care trust fund. Um, the team that manages the trust fund, we meet routinely to study trends and look at options and, and uh, provide counsel, if you will, to the group of employees, the insurance advisory committee, uh, to look at options. And, and fortunately, that organization has made some proactive changes very strict as far as setting premium rate structures, and that has all benefit to a healthy health care trust fund, which we're taking some advantage of now. Um, you know, the problem with the GIC is that it only shows up once a year, and you have no access to managing that uh, capability. 
it works great for communities whose premium costs are skyrocketing and you know they can take advantage of HMO plans. You know, but we have a geographic variation that's suitable here, not necessarily made up of our eastern communities yeah. that are dominating the GIC. So it doesn't make logical sense to continue. Um, so that's why I said I think the timing uh, seems to be appropriate. But there doesn't seem to be anything on our radar to suggest for quite some time that we would need to take any corrective action on premium costs. Okay. Thank you. Since we're going to be talking about this and having to vote on it, if it's okay, I'd like to wrap this up. This is really just a quick, uh, this is what's going on, and we'll be talking about it a lot later. It's okay. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> so, no, so at this point, I think um, I'd be happy <coughs> to um, move on unless anyone has questions about the update, um, just so that we are conscious of time, because I know there's a few discussions we want to have tonight. Great. Okay, so moving on to you, Mass Partnership Update. Great. So I am very pleased tonight um, to have uh, Dr. Rebecca Woodland here from UMass, who began the UMass Partnership with our school system. Also, Sarah Whitcomb and Laura Valdivieso is here, and Shannon Berry, who is a doctoral student um, with us. Um, and Sarah, uh, I should say, Dr. Whitcomb and Dr. <laughs> Valdivieso are um, also professors in, at UMass. So I'm sure they can explain a little bit of who they are and how they're connected to our work. But I'm thrilled to have um, Rebecca here to give you kind of an update on the work that we've been um, have been undertaking for about a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. so do folks have a copy of the slides? Can we get those out? And do we have it um, somewhere? Yeah. Great. Okay, technology. Which I can't help with. I love it. The man at the back with the I know. pointer. I love that. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Superintendent Garrick, um, for that introduction. And it's really great to be here. And I want to thank the school committee for the opportunity to come and give an update on the really incredible work that the district has been doing in partnership with the School of Education at UMass. I also really uh, want to take the opportunity to thank the members of the district instructional leadership team which is made up of all the principals and assistant principals directors and the superintendent and some of whom are here tonight that I'm looking at I just want to really thank them because the partnership really rests on the work of the folks from the district and the folks at UMass and so that district instructional leadership team is incredible um, that said a lot of the work has involved going into schools and conducting instruction around so I want to thank the teachers and some of whom I'm sure are here tonight who have had their classrooms visited and have participated in elements of the partnership and for the students who have put up with these strangers running around in the hallways um, and last but not least I do want to just thank my colleagues because even though I will be doing most most of the direct talking in this presentation. This is absolutely a group team effort. And again, that is Dr. Laura Valdivieza from Teacher Education and Curriculum Studies and Dr. Sarah Whitcomb from the Department of Student Development and Shannon Berry from the Department of Student Development. So thanks. Um, and I will also say that, uh, yes, it was 18 months ago that Superintendent Garrick and I got together to talk about how we might really launch a partnership, a meaningful partnership. And I'll, I'll just say that um, I'm invested in this not just from an area of expertise, because I am a professor of educational leadership and have a, uh, a long history of working in schools and with schools and in higher ed, but also I have two children in the system. So I want to say I have two kids in the public schools, so I'm invested on multiple levels. So you should have a copy of the slides, and there it is. And uh, it's up on the screen. And so I'd like to just start with, and I don't have the clicker. Do I magically wave at this wonderful man at the back? Or? OK. I'll magically wave at Deb. Thank you. Great. All right, so we'd just like to start with, um, and I will go as quickly as I possibly can, an overview of the work from the summer of 2010 to the present. Would you like the committee to hold probing questions oh, until yes. the end? Thank and you. And then just ask if there are clarifying questions that you really just need, what the heck are you talking about? You can ask her in the middle, but otherwise let's hold the probing until. Yes, so I'll go as quickly as I can, but if there's something that you're like, what is that acronym or what is that, please just ask. And then we'll save, yeah, the probing questions until the end. That would be great. So great. So the overall goal when we were thinking about how do we put this partnership together, what would be its you know, core purpose? It had to do with building district capacity for teacher collaboration and continuous instructional improvement, the core of the work of a school district, student learning through instruction, and then the capacity for collaboration to improve instruction. 
So you can just click through these dev, they can all go at the same time. But so here are some of the key things that we have done. First and foremost, we formed the district instructional leadership team, which did not exist, which now meets twice a month for two hours and sometimes more. Um, and as a result of the work of the district instructional leadership team, forming school instructional leadership teams. So the systems through which we can do this work. We have implemented instructional rounds. Um, at a numerous a number of schools and more to come before the end of the school year. We have um, integrated other initiatives going on in the district that come from the School of Education. And I just want to say right off the bat that a lot of this work with the partnership building came about because what we found is that, and you have found and we have experienced, that in the Amherst Regional Public Schools, there were professors and people from the School of Education that were doing things, but they weren't talking to each other. So one of the things we really tried to do was take some of the major important core work of the district and say, who are those people? Let's get them together and let's have them overlap their language a bit and see, where, see uh, how we can weave it together and what's the common storyline. So positive behavior interventions and support and English language learner teacher support, um, all relating to issues of equity around instruction and building systems for collaboration to do those things, we've really integrated into the partnership. Um, in terms of evaluation work, we launched in the fall of 2010 a district-wide survey on collaboration and effects of instruction on practice, and we're doing it again currently right now. We have 299 responses to the survey currently right now. Um, we've also engaged in something called social network analysis, which is a mathematical method for really empirically examining collaboration, which can be this fuzzy thing that many of us have our own definitions for, but really trying to nail it down. And we've also hosted a summit, a partnership summit in district, which had about 40 people. Uh, people not just from the School of Ed, but from all over UMass, Civic, uh, Center for Civic and Community Engagement and others, the School of Ed across um, and across the school system to really identify where to go next. And also, and I, I, I want to emphasize this, this may seem small, but for the first time ever, the School of Education at UMass pooled money across departments to create a position inside the School of Ed just for the school district, a research liaison position. Because another thing that was happening in the school district is that we individually as faculty members were getting calls from individual people, and some of you included, saying, hey, do you have any information on late start times? Do you have any information on, is there a research brief on? And it was very one-to-one. -one. And we said, you know what, let's have a point of contact where Amherst Regional Schools could go to this liaison through a process, and we could have a point of contact for that work. So that's been Megan Shulda, who's a doc student, doctoral student in teacher education and curriculum studies, who's been that point of contact. And Rhonda Cohen, Dr. Cohen's, worked on a process for how those um, connections get made. So that's sort of an overview. There's much more, but those are some highlights. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, this is about building district capacity for teacher collaboration and instructional improvement. And I just want to get right to what would those variables be? If we're trying to build district capacity, what are those aspects of district capacity that we want to study and mess with and improve and see what we can do about them? And there are, there are five that we're working with, all grounded in research, and there's some citations there for you. I should also say that, obviously, we're packing this into a 30-minute period, but if at any point, any aspect of this you want more information on or you want to have a smaller meeting about it, we're all happy to do that at any time. So these are the variables that we think about when, in terms of whether it's about straight instructional improvement, whether it's about ELL teachers, teachers that work with English language learners, whether it's about positive behavior interventions and support, they all revolve around this need for collaboration. Adults working with other adults to figure out what to do and how to do it. So we would consider this. Who's working with whom? Why are they together? For what purpose to what end? How often do they meet? How much time do they actually have to meet and do that work? At what level of quality are those teams working? Because we all know teams can come together, but what happens there is sometimes up for grabs. We want to know what's the quality there. And then lastly, so you have many, many teams, let's say, what is the capacity of the district for the innovation or the knowledge to spread or go to scale? So if we learn something really good about instruction somewhere, how do we make it go across classrooms and across schools? So those are our five variables that we're working with. And okay, don't hit the net. Yeah, good. Leave it right there. That's good. <laughs> so what we want to do is we have some pictures of, that have, we've generated through social network analysis to show you the current capacity for teacher collaboration in the district. And we have three examples. And I want to thank Mark Jackson and Mike Hayes and um, others for, and Nick Yaffe, who's not here, but for um, 
and all the administrators in the district who for a while now have been responding to our requests for information about who's working with whom, when, for how long, for what purpose, so that we could feed it into an empirical process called social network analysis. So we want to show you the results of the capacity on those variables. So here is the high school. I know it's hard to see and you don't have to know all of it yet. But there is a picture of the high school. And Shannon, do you want to explain what those parts of that are? Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of a cool picture, but what is, I mean, what is it? It's just kind of some lines. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I have a, a soft voice. Um, can you hear me right now? <laughs> okay, so all of this data um, was taken from the principals. And just do a stand up. So all of this information was taken from the principals. Um, and we, we asked them to identify who, what teams exist and then what people exist on those teams. And I input it into a nice statistical software and come out with these nice pictures. Um, we also asked how often do they meet and what do they meet about. So um, the size of those octagons indicate how often they meet. So in this particular school, the high school, um, the that team up there, which is child study, meets the most often, whereas the rest, which are department, le uh, meet the least often. Um, the triangles or squares indicate which, whether it's teacher or non-teacher. And then um, the color of, this, of the nodes um, identify what they, what they discuss. So the blue would indicate non-instruction, non-student learning, and then green would be instruction, teacher instruction, student learning, things like that. Um, so, Great. yeah. Thank you. Um, and so I want to say that we also, um, as Shannon said, we asked the administrators for that information. However, we also did the websites and looked at the org charts, and I can't work a microphone. It's yeah, the, yeah, TV, it's the TV, TV that's TV. the problem. I need it for TV. All right. Okay. Great. Um, so we also did it off the websites and the org charts and also have verified through the teacher collaboration survey this information where we've asked every teacher in the district, what teams are you on? So we're very interested in the formal networks that exist in the district. So notice that this kind of picture, and now we've gone to the middle school, oh, notice oh. that this kind of picture shows us four of the five variables about this district's capacity for collaboration. It shows us who's working with whom. It shows us basically for what purpose. And again, blue is non-direct instruction student learning classroom. Green is closest to the classroom and instruction. So it gives us at least that level. It gives us some information about how often, how much time they have together. And you're looking at the middle school's picture. And if you just look at that picture, can you flip back to the high school, Deb, for a minute? You just look at that and go back to the middle school. You can tell the first was the high school, very departmentalized. You can see the departments. And in the middle school, you can see the teaming going on. So at first blush, you can see that the capacity against those variables for collaboration is stronger at the middle school currently than at the high school. Of course, there's other things we need to find out. Other things to note about these pictures is you can tell who the bridges are or where the bridging groups are or where the bridging people are. That's very important when you're trying to build capacity. Where do you go? Where do you put your resources? Um, and if you go one slide further, this is an example of the elementary. This is Wildwood's current map. And you can see that there's isolate outlier teams without formal connections to the rest of the collaborative network. So there's work to be done, but I just want to say this. This is currently, when we did this originally, there were many more isolates, many more outliers, um, more blue, less green, and we did work right away to reconfigure. We immediately formed a district leadership team and school instructional leadership teams to get the focus on instruction. Okay, thank you. Okay, so why would we be focused on um, so much on collaboration? And perhaps it goes without saying, but I think it's important that just to put out the Amherst school system, regional school system's theory of action about collaboration, which is that sustained job embedded discipline collaboration is the primary engine through which ongoing and targeted improvements in instruction will occur. So we know that 
the greatest, can you go back, Deb? I'm sorry. That's all right. We know that the greatest influence that a district controls over student learning is the quality of instruction. And we know that what improves instruction are instructors together examining student work and their practice in relation to what it's doing for student learning. <coughs> so such improvements in collaboration and instruction will lead to access, participation, and achievement for all students. So it's a real issue of equity as well. It's about instruction that increases every student's access to the curriculum and learning, participation in it, and their achievement and outcomes. Great. So what does that mean, a disciplined cycle of collaboration? We could all say that we think we know what that means. And so we've done a lot of work, the team, and over the past 18 months in the district's instruction leadership, leadership team trying to figure that out. So just in a nutshell, to say that Discipline job embedded teacher collaboration would involve some level of dialogue with one another where there's agendas, we know what we're talking about, why we're talking about, there aren't hibernators, there aren't dominators, protocols are used, there are structures and so forth. Decisions actually get made about what to keep doing with our teaching, stop doing with our teaching and change what we're doing with our teaching. All teaching is not created equal, we know this, we have to use collaboration to figure out what we're going to sift out. And then take action on it, go do the keep starts and change out there, all of us interdependently and then evaluate the effects of our, the quality of the actions we took and the effects of our actions and then continue to engage in dialogue. Thank you Deb. Okay, so we wanted to give you an opportunity to get a flavor of a teacher team engaging in that cycle of inquiry in one targeted way. And one targeted way that exists is called error analysis. And that's where, that is where some projects, some assignments, something's happened for the students, the student work has come back and there are errors. Mistakes, there are responses given or things are created that the teacher was expecting something different, some other level of achievement on. And so there's some error and so it's to analyze the error and that's what goes on in these teams. So I just want to direct your attention, these are the five questions that a team would use in their dialogue if they're thinking about a process they would use if they're doing error analysis. But there's many reasons to meet, one of them is error analysis. And that is a teacher saying, why might the students have been thinking, what have they been thinking to make this error? So in other words, the team generates the hypotheses about what would make this error occur? How can we find out which is true? A lot of the work in teacher teams, and I, I don't think I can emphasize this enough, I say this a lot in different districts and in here, that a lot of the time in teacher teaming, a lot of time is spent <coughs> diagnosing or finding solutions to the wrong problem. And so we need ways to get to the right problem, the actual problem, so that then we can generate the instructional solutions to it. And so that's number two, really. Three is what different teaching strategies could we use to fix or undo whatever led to the error and help them move their skills? So what can we do differently instructionally? Four, how are each of us going to plan and manage it so that we can reteach it? Each of us, so that we can reteach it, or restructure so that you take those kids, I'll take those kids so it can get done. And then how can the team help? Is there a way to share and exchange knowledge, skill, or students to benefit both students and colleagues? So we would like to show you a clip of a team doing this. This is an English language arts team and there was an essay type of prompting open-ended response assignment given and this teacher is bringing it to the table. The website that Deb is going to is the Research for Better Teaching website. They have a ton of excellent videos and um, resources for teachers and administrators on how to do this work and we're going to the six minute mark. That's Jonathan Sow. There you go. And follow the error analysis agenda of five questions. I gave it to the students. Um, they spent maybe 10, 15 minutes reading a story. And then, um, Can you enlarge it down there? So they gave them. And I had the responses from um, five of the students uh, right here. Uh, the first question asks uh, Why doesn't Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones say that she didn't smash people's pocketbooks when she was younger and wanted things she could not get? Um, and we consider this to be the easiest of the three questions. So the correct answer was uh, she did things when she was younger that she was not proud of. So um, two of the students got that right. Um, and the other ones, um, some of the, the responses that they chose, um, one of them said um, 
she wanted the boy to feel really bad about what he did. Um, and uh, you know, we asked the students to provide evidence for their answers so we could see kind of you know what they were thinking when they chose the things that they chose. Um, the student wrote, um, because she did not want him to think she was just going to let him go, she wanted to scare him a little. So um, I think he was just kind of uh, going on his own there, and you know, kind of um, thinking about his story as a whole. And this student wrote. Um, it happened, then she say it. So um, he circled, she saw the boy frown. Um, so he thinks she didn't say that she didn't snatch people's pocketbooks because she saw the boy frown. So um, I think that might make some sense for the reading, because it does say something about um, how, she, how the boy did frown. So I think, you know, he was distracted by that. He just saw the word frown, and he saw the word frown in the story, and he thought that that was the correct answer. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of curious as to maybe why the student struggled on the first one so much, the first question. Um, also thinking about ways that I can help this student, um, you know, really focus in on the things he should be focusing in on. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested to know, or to see how he would do if you read him the story and then have him answer it. If maybe it's not so much that he doesn't understand it, it's just that he doesn't know how to read it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find that with a lot of kids, you know, like it, I feel like there's a lot of kids that are just low readers, decoders, I should say, and high comprehenders, and then there's also the vice versa who was younger and wanted things she could not get. Yeah, that's a complicated question. Mm -hmm. Just hearing you read it, why I was doesn't she say that she that. didn't? You know, right. all those negatives in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder. It seems like the kids, the wrong responses are like <coughs> sort of like almost like an immature gut response, like a student might have. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I can imagine them answering what, just what they thought in that from the passage. Right. You know what I mean? Like, why like would someone say that? Right. You know? Not like based on what the. The passage said. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, don't know. I don't know how early you did this, but um, I mean, freshmen, I don't know that they had the experience of thinking search. I'm assuming they didn't. I know that, like, by the sophomore year, they get plenty of experience with it, but because they've been here, but I don't know. And so I think that this whole process is just so different for them. Well, I think, you know, analyzing closely, you know, what they, they chose for their evidence. Um, would be would be one thing uh, as well as talking to them and um, could you be as straightforward as almost giving them a question here's the right answer yeah did you answer it this way because the double negatives you didn't understand it or you would answer just on your, like you just say is this why yeah are my assumptions uh, correct right almost like a multiple choice question yeah a multiple my, choice and my, uh, wrong. Yeah. yeah to maybe just to help it i mean this is a short story and it is very short but maybe for a student it's not very short so um like for example this question i think was i wrote on my sheet okay so it came in like whatever it came up with 72 if you took this question and embedded it just after the paragraph, and then maybe took this question, number two, and embedded it, well, that would have been at the end of the story. And then this, well, this one would be a little bit more difficult because this one, there are um, support for that all throughout the story, almost probably on every page. So maybe that one would be a little bit more difficult, but that one might be the most challenging. But if you were to take some and like embed a think and search question after every page mm -hmm. just to get them used to the process like this is where you need to look, this is where you need to look, and then you can do this one which is another the top of the story at the Sorry, I was distracted. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Yeah. I saw a lot of people nodding their heads when the suggestion was made that maybe the question was confusing, that there were double yeah. negatives in it. And um, I think just the opportunity for teachers to put the work out, uh, the student results and the actual assignment out together at the same time enables feedback to come from a variety of different directions. And in fact, all of those could have been true issues, uh, problems. It could have been the double negatives for some students. It could have been um, that they didn't know how to read it for others. And it could have been that they were using their gut reaction and they would be able to craft responses. And it, Deb, could you go back? Um, 
one slide. So just to illustrate again, that team was engaged in a process of dialogue using a protocol of error analysis. By the end of that meeting, they'd made decisions about what they were going to do in class to figure out the right hypothesis and how they would reteach, how the reteaching was going to happen. Then they would need to take action and go do it and see what happens and bring, evaluate it and bring it back to the table. Often with teaming, a lot of us in teams, is we do engage in dialogue and we may make decisions, but we often don't get through the, now let's go take action and try it out and bring it back to the dialogue. That's one of the key components of the cycle of inquiry um, and will be a major focus for next year in this district and through the partnership. All right, so if we go ahead. All right, so, so far in this, in this update, in the presentation of the partnership, the focus has been heavily on that first part of that theory of action, which is sustained, disciplined, job-embedded teacher collaboration leads to instructional improvement. Now I just want to present a little bit about the work, the hard work, the incredible work that the district instructional leadership team has been doing to get some shared sense of fundamental instructional practices. You know, we might take it for granted to say, well, we all know what best instruction is, but if we have 100 people teaching, we have 100 different responses to what might be most fundamental. Um, in medicine, there is a checklist. Atul Gawande and others have developed checklists for this is what happens before surgery, or this is what happens in medicine, and it reduces mortality and increases, uh, makes it easier for patients to recover. In education, we struggle. Often people say we're a profession without a shared practice. You know, what are our core fundamental practices? And it is highly unusual for a district to take on the task of saying, we're going to identify our fundamental instructional practices. And I just really want to commend the district for taking on that really, the district are human beings, the human beings taking on the really hard work of figuring that out. So, because it has resulted in this goal that was established last year to say for this year, by June, all members of the district instructional leadership team will hold a shared understanding of this district's fundamental instructional practices. And you might ask, well, what would make something fundamental? Fundamental would be we'd expect to see it 99% of the time with 99% of the students in 99% of the classrooms, and it would be those practices that teachers would be spending their time examining and improving and ensuring that it's happening. And that we would be providing resources and professional development in order to do that. So they, would, they were saying by the, go back one slide, by the end of, June, which is coming up, that the district would have a shared understanding of fundamental instructional practices articulated to their faculty and have facilitated the development of a strong culture. Well, we bit off more than we can chew with the last little bite there, like, yeah, we're going to have a strong culture by the end of the year. But we are getting closer because now the next slide. This is a document that was adopted April 25th. And I can tell you the work that goes into having 23 educators uh, say that they believe in eight fundamental instructional practices <laughs> with the same terms. Okay, it's a, it is a big deal. It's a, and it's really impressive. And I've had many a district call me up and say, can we get a copy of that? You know, we'd like to adopt that. And I'll, I'll say, no, you, you work to construct it because it's your culture of what you want to say is fundamental. So just to say, there are eight over here, eight bins of fundamental instructional practices with brief descriptions and attributes, what will impact its quality, and how it's connected to student learning. And this is very key. Those eight are high leverage. If you mess with the quality of questioning in the classroom, you affect the other ones overall. They're high leverage. They lead to the others. Um, the only one that stands out as one to be not wary of, but to be clear about, is the direct instruction that too much of it actually can bring down the other ones. But it's a, definitely a fundamental practice that we want to be good at when we are doing it. Um, one thing to notice about this framework is that you don't see a bunch of citations and capital letters and acronyms because there is no consensus in the field of education about fundamental instructional practices. There isn't any. If it's going to exist, it's going to exist in district because a district's leadership team and faculty has said, these are they. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and research and toolkits and bins that will tell you what they are. And there's a lot of overlap between them. They did that work to figure out what it was, and here it is. So, all right, <coughs> last slide. So some highlights, just to reiterate, and direct future directions. Um, one thing we want to stress is that there really has been an integration of innovations and initiatives. I want to say from the School of Ed side, and the district side, between initiatives and between people, we are all much more speaking the same language with one another um, and can represent the interests of 
you know, I can walk out and represent the school district on some major reform initiatives because I'm intimately involved, and so can I. And the reverse is also true. Um, we've had district level instructional rounds, which is difficult to pull off, but it's happened at Crocker Farm, the high school, and Wildwood, it's upcoming at Fort River. And this past year, the middle school has really taken on and adopted in a very systematic, meaningful way the introduction of instructional rounds housed at the middle school. They've adopted a FIPS framework. This coming year, we really want to get into, you know, those variables we talked about, about district capacity for collaboration. The one variable that we don't really know a lot about yet is the fourth one, which is what's happening in the teams. What is the quality of those cycles of inquiry? And that's where the energy needs to go. That means cycles of inquiry in our ELL teacher teams, qualities of inquiry in our PBIS teams, qualities of inquiry in our department, grade level, content teams, and so forth. And then we do want to just make sure that everything we're doing is continuing to strengthen the U.S. Amherst SOE and ARPS partnership in other domains. Um, a lot has been written on school university partnerships and they're difficult to do because of the complex cultures going on and bureaucracies. But there are basically four ways that schools and universities partner. They partner around pre-service, I'm gonna, they partner around K-12 student learning, a shared mission around K-12 student learning. They partner around pre-service teacher education. They partner around professional development and they partner around shared inquiry. In our work thus far, we've really been in the bin of professional development and a little bit on shared inquiry. So there, is, there are places to really continue to think about how might we weave in those other big bins that we really both care about, like pre-service teacher education, and how to do that. Okay. And all that with four minutes for Christ. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Yep. So questions, keeping in mind we're supposed to start the next item in five minutes, which isn't going to happen, <laughs> but, uh, but Just questions? Just the beginning. No questions? Catherine. Well, I, first I want to thank you um, and thank all of you. This is an unbelievable amount of work in 18 months, given that um, you started with none of these teams and um, sort of none of this in place and really providing, it sounds like, if I understand it correctly, the, the, the really the, the structure or the holding of um, improved instruction and improve learning across the district. And that's incredibly exciting, I think. Um, so thank you, all of you. And um, I do have one question, and maybe, but I, so I'm so curious about how does one measure the quality of inquiry within the groups? I mean, how will you look at that, and, and how does it get a, well, evaluated or measured? Um, I love that question because that's, we all want to know, I mean, we want to collaborate with one another and we want to do well. So what does it look like and what does right. it feel like? So that one visual of the cycle of inquiry yeah. has some phrases on it and we actually have about three different metrics and rubrics that teachers can self-assess, that administrators can use in observations um, for that very purpose, to give it the quality of inquiry. And it's also... Um, it is also the purpose of the district-wide survey that's out right now, which asks every teacher to identify the core team closest to instruction and comment on a Likert scale about the quality of dialogue, decision-making, action, and evaluation. And we did it in 2010, and we're doing it now. So we have, we have a baseline, we're moving forward, and we have data on that. Um, and that will be for the administrators and the teams to use. It's not meant in any way to be punitive or, or gotcha. I mean, the, the idea is what's happening, right. let's figure it out, and now let's build capacity. Do you need protocols for dialogue? What, what do you need? Do you need examples of how teams work together and analyze student work? Um, what do, you, do you need student data to look at? What, you know, what do you need to make that happen? I have never encountered resistance from teachers in any way, shape, or form for this work. In fact, um, I know one item on the survey right now, and we have 299 responses to it, it's 96% of teachers either agreeing or strongly agreeing with that theory of action about collaboration. So it's not the will, it's the means and the capacity. Right. And you know, some of this capa these capacity issues, that's one aspect, the quality of the team, but we have to get them time to meet together. We have to get the right people at the table. So there are those issues too that go with quality. Right, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, so you showed in the slides one example from uh, of an elementary school, but are you looking all across the board, including Pelham? All of them. Okay, and... As Lisa Desjardins can attest to the amount of information that you requested. <laughs> very good. Well, and, and in this, um, some point we 
very much my like to pick your brains on the idea of two-way immersion uh, as regard ELL. And can I just say that I'm so excited about this whole process and that it's supportive to teachers, it opens up classroom doors, and it empowers them and respects them to work together to collaborate, and it makes it intrinsic, intrinsic for them because then it's helping their students and helping their learning, and they're not alone in what they're doing, and it's just so respectful, so thank you. Uh, it's very impressive, and uh, thank you. I guess since I'm not an educator, but I'm more an organizational person, the question is, you know, you're talking about culture, and it's really about sustainability so that this is not an initiative that's driven by personalities and the personalities go away. So I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit about what it's going to take from a district level to sort of build that culture so that when we had different superintendents and we had different professors and we had different principals that there was a culture that it's going forward. Um, so it all goes down. Those people <laughs> no. uh, well, you know, first and foremost, bricks and mortar don't collaborate, people do, right? right? So it is first and foremost about people and relationships, and you need champions for the work, because partnership work is not easy in, um, in any case. So there has to be more uh, more people. It has to spread. It can't be a Rebecca thing, a Maria thing, an us thing, a school thing. There has to be more people involved in the conversation about why do we exist, why are we here, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, and it's not always about the money because collaboration is supposed to exist in some ways so that you, when you have dwindling resources, you come together in your shared mission and not everybody has to do the same. We don't have to repeat, the, you know, redundant, so many redundancies. So it's coming together and figure out how our missions overlap and picking those most important things part of our mission and say, okay, well, how can we do them together instead of us all doing them individually? But that, we need a system and a structure to do that. Um, and so Maria has done a lot of work to create venues and forums, uh, like the Five College Partnership meeting that goes on. We now are hosting meetings inside the school that about the partnership with the school system and bringing it to the table. We meet regularly, so we need to have more connections that are ongoing and sustained. Thanks. I just wanted to mention that I've come to believe that inconsistency is maybe one of the biggest problems we have in, from class to class, school to school. I'm guessing this helps that a lot by getting people talking together to hear how, you know, everybody does things. Uh, do you find that that's helping already, or do you, do you think it will help? Well, I'll just say I, I couldn't agree with you um, more. Um, it's really important that we identify what, what brings about learning and make sure every kid gets it. Mm -hmm. That's at the heart of this work. And one way to do that is what we just saw in this video, is you put a few teachers together and go, hey, by the way, that's a really confusing question. So we get shared understandings of things. Um, and then it's also equally important that that team, like that team we saw in the video, is now somehow connected to another team so that the learnings and lessons from that don't stay just with that team. Like Laura's doing, Dr. Valdivieso is doing a lot of work with the ELL teachers. We're learning a lot there about what's best for those kids and in relation to certain curriculum that we're implementing. We want those lessons to scale through the network. So absolutely it is supposed to address that. No more questions? All right. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Okay, moving on to later start time discussion. So I think there may be four parts of this conversation. One is to hear from the superintendent and administrators what their latest thinking is, uh, what their, if their recommendation is still the same. The other is we're getting more information tonight about other aspects of this. Uh, the third thing is to hear from each other how we're thinking about it. And the fourth thing is to vote if we feel like we're ready to vote. Um, if we don't feel like we're ready to vote, we shouldn't vote. But. So why don't we start with um, sure. either the extra information or your latest thinking. Sure. I just, you know, I'd just like to frame it a little bit. Um, you know, I really appreciate that more questions have been coming from the committee and I'm sure from the community as well through the committee uh, for us to think about and respond to. So I did share some information with you from my reaching out um, to other superintendents in the area. Um, I know Rich has some substantial information that he'd like to share tonight with the committee around athletics, some of the specific questions on what is this potentially going to look like in the afternoons and um, also what sports will be 
potentially affected by a later start given if we are at this moment at a nine o'clock start time. So he has some very specific information. I did um, send out to all of you recognizing that this information came really late. So I recognize you may or may not be willing and ready um, to really address and, and vote tonight. Um, and I understood that. I also um, asked Debbie to craft a motion for consideration whenever you're in that um, position, whether that's tonight or within the next few weeks, uh, that really talks about what you would be authorizing for, um, for me to be able to move forward for 2013-2014. Also with a very clear understanding, because I felt it was important to put into the motion that if Amherst, Leverett, Pelham, or Shootsbury school committees do not approve this, um, earlier, um, the later start time, and, and really for them it would be the earlier start time at their elementary schools, we would have to bring that back in front of the regional committee for reconsideration. So, and I also put in, if there were other unforeseen financial or educational obstacles that might come up in those 16, um, that 16 month period, that this committee would, I would be bringing that back to you. I know some of our conversation has been around that, um, that issue. So again, we want to acknowledge that we are a unique configuration because we are not one single um, governance structure, not one single entity. We have uh, multiple towns to consider in this and we have to be sensitive to the fact that we are interconnected in many ways, in particular around our transportation. So if one school chooses not to, we, we are back having this conversation again and I think we need to put that up front. Um, so I think it might be helpful to, I think a lot of the questions last time, if the committee's comfortable going in this direction, was around athletics. So I wanted to be able to, to have Rich come up when you're ready to do so. Michael. Is there a reason we can see the motion whether we vote or not, but at least have a sense of Yeah, it's part of the handout. Did you get that one, Michael? It's on the it's last, the last page. page of the handout. Oh, I mean, yep. Yeah, the last it was page just, of the thing you handed out yeah, today. Yes. Okay, <laughs> and then I sent also by read, email, right? I think. So again, you know, really late in the game to send more information, but again, I'm trying to be responsive to the things that keep coming up so that people don't feel rushed. They feel like they're able to really be thoughtful around this, this issue. So I would like to hear from Rich first. Okay. okay. Oh, and I have some handouts from Rich. Sure, that'd be great. Whatever you're comfortable with, Rich. Thank you. Of course, our principles as well. Thank you. Okay. So I want to first of all thank Rich because you know we sent him back with a few tasks, which was to speak to the other athletic directors in the area and gather some information. And he also spent a lot of time analyzing. Um, different seasons and when the sun is coming up and when the sun is setting and the effect on athletics. So um, I think this is probably lots and lots of information. I'm sorry? Of course I do. Here, you can have mine. I'm going to share. It's okay. Thank you. One second. Mike's going to... Uh... I think oh, I'm it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Mike's it gonna help me with some clicking from over there. It's good. I can share with Debbie. It's fine. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. Yes, yeah, so I apologize for this coming in as late as it did. I was collecting data from uh, athletic directors all week last week. Um, so, what I'd like to talk about is outlined on this first slide. So, the impacts um, in regards to practices, games, uh, any financial impacts, and then a little bit about. Uh, the, the input I gathered from directly from uh, other athletic directors in the Pioneer Valley Interathletic Conference. Okay, Mike. Uh, so this is what uh, a practice day would look like um, for our athletes. So with school beginning at 9 a.m., ending at 3.35, um, with our after-school help session, um, students could, would get out of that at 4.15 and then be ready to go for practice at 4.30. Um, and I, I base this on basically a, a length of practice no longer than two hours because I think that's a, a reasonable amount of time to get done with what we need to get done in, in a practice. Okay. Um, so using that, basically what I went through is I, I looked at September 1st, 15th, October 1st, 15th, and, and the 30th, and then looked at a 4.30 start time. 
when the sun sets and then how much time you would actually have for practice on those dates. So you see at the beginning of, of September, plenty of time. By the end of October, we're down to a little over an hour and a quarter until sunset. Um, so that means that um, to our practices, no problem until about early October, and then they're starting to get reduced, you know, to about an hour and 15 minutes by the end of the fall. Um, and I, so I did the same thing with the winter. Um, and obviously the winter time, we've got less of an impact because most of our sports are indoors, but we do have a couple of sports that are, that are outdoors. So you see um, that there's not a significant amount of time for, uh, for outdoor practices starting at 4.30 in the afternoon. So I looked at the, at the morning as well, just to, just to look and see what that was like starting. We started to practice at 6.30 a.m. Um, and went to 8 a.m. Um, the sports that this is for are, are off-site, so Nordic skiing, generally practicing at Cherry Hill. Um, so they would need time to get back, get ready, and get to, get to school by 9. So I considered 8 o'clock sort of an end time for that practice and then looking at when, uh, when the sun rises and how much time again. So maybe an hour at the beginning um, and, and towards the end. Um, so then I went into a couple of details about how practices, uh, practice times would impact specific sports. Uh, so right now, uh, the girls and boys basketball program share the high school and the middle school gym. Very complicated schedule that goes on. We also share with LSSE. Um, but the big thing is that at the high school, basically <coughs> practices are run starting at 3 p.m. and ending at 9 p.m. Um, every day. Uh, so if we bump this up by the 75 minutes, some of our practices would be getting out at, you know, after 10 o'clock, if we continue with the current structure of, of after-school practices for basketball. Um, Nordic skiing, like I said before, um, they wouldn't be able to practice in the morning or afternoon. So really at this point, we don't really have a feasible plan for how Nordic uh, would continue with uh, the proposed schedule uh, change. And we have about 40 athletes participating in Nordic uh, this past season. So ice hockey, as I mentioned before, the traditional practice time for ice hockey has been 3 to 4 p.m. at Orr Rank. It's been that way for probably 30 plus years. Um, since then, things have kind of moved in around it in terms of a women's team at Amherst College and youth, youth hockey and things like that. So um, right now it doesn't fit in with the scheduled Orr for us to change. They might have some flexibility that would allow for that. The other option would be is to move over to, to UMass, um, but it would, you know, potentially triple our ice time costs um, if we were to, to go with that option. Um, alpine skiing, they do dry land training three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That wouldn't be impacted at all because it's mostly indoor um, at the middle school in one of the side gyms. One day a week, uh, they, get, they get on the mountain one day a week for practice, and that's on Tuesdays. Um, and if we did this without any sort of early release, they would have an hour and 15 minutes less of practice um, each week because the ski mountain closes at a certain time. Um, in terms of, uh, I kind of folded in a little bit of competition for Alpine here. Um, in terms of their races, their races are on Thursdays, and they start at 5 p.m., Athletes get there, they help set up the course and then walk the course. So they actually have to be there, you know, about an hour before practice. So we'd need probably an early release um, for those days for them to compete because that's all the PVIAC uh, ski teams compete at the same time. So we wouldn't be able to change those times. Yep. Early. Is that 45 minutes earlier than, than what? Then, three, then 3.35. Then 3.35. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so in the spring, this is what our practice... I'm sorry. Sh sure. Um, and how many, how many uh, students are in the Alpine skiing team? Uh, ten this year. Ten. Actually, no. There, were, uh, there were ended up being eight this year. How many in hockey? Well, I'll get the hockey one. One second. Oh, 16 this year in hockey. Next year we're looking at, at about 20. Um, so spring, as you can see, spring pra practice times start end of March. There's not really any issue uh, with spring practice times. There's plenty of time for us to, um, to practice in the spring after school with this schedule. Uh, so you can just 
right by that one. <laughs> so so now I, I looked at um, actual game days, and the, the biggest um, adjustments have to do with, with uh, away games. So in this case scenario, students wouldn't have to necessarily stay for away games um, for that after school period, because right now we, have, we release them before that time. So currently um, our buses are able to leave at about uh, 2.45 for away games. Uh, so in this case, if we had a bus leave, students get out at 3.35, they leave at 4. Um, arrival times between 4.45 and 5. Um, if you get traffic in there, obviously, that can, that can change things a little bit as well. So looking at that, 15-minute warm-up time. Um, the earliest start time we're looking at is about 5.15 for, for away contests. So these are just some travel, kind of average travel times. I talked with, uh, with Peter Krause in transportation and, and just got his kind of uh, idea about travel times to most of the places we compete against. So the longest trips are, are down, obviously, to, to Springfield and, and south of Springfield, upwards of you know, 50 to 60 minutes. So in terms of the length of events um, for sort of the light dependent sports, we've got cross country about two hours um, with the races and the walkthroughs that they do of the courses beforehand. Um, soccer games timed at about an hour and a half. Um, field hockey games, same thing. And then golf, uh, generally about three hours for, for golf matches. Um, so again, I went through and put in, if you had a start time, 5.15, sunset, how much time you would actually have um, to get these, these away games in. Um, so you see at the beginning again, you have enough until about the, you know, halfway through September, um, where it starts to get to be close in terms of being able to fit games in. Good. Uh, so I, I broke down also the number of games for each sport after September 15th, so you get an idea of, of what that looks like. Most of the sports in the fall um, play between 16 or are involved in between 16 and, and 18 contests. So this is how many after the 15th. Um, so the things that are most impacted in the fall, um, field hockey, um, home varsity games, we're able to start at 415, not a problem. Um, JV games wouldn't be able to finish starting about mid-September. Um, one of the reasons with that is that uh, in field hockey, and the same thing goes for girls lacrosse, they have to play um, the varsity first and then the JV second because there are not enough officials to do side-by-side uh, -side field hockey or girls lacrosse games. So you usually get the same officials refing a, a JV and a varsity game. And a lot of times it's also the availability of field space. Um, so basically for, for our away games, it wouldn't be possible to fit in uh, JV games starting at 515, which it would be very challenging to run a JV program where you couldn't have you know, away games starting at 515. Um, potentially you could do JV games on other days, uh, but then we're getting into to increased transportation costs at that point. So we'd have to look at that. Um, golf, the MIAA, similar to uh, alpine skiing, uh, golf mandates a 3 p.m. start for, for their matches because they're about three hours long. We could potentially push it to 3.30 um, until about mid-September. Uh, some schools have said that weekend matches are a possibility depending on, uh, depending on their home course. Um, so potentially athletes would need uh, releases of maybe an hour. Um, I, I can't tell you exactly how many times a season because I don't know exactly how many schools we'd be able to get to, to play on a weekend. Um, but I, it would be probably, I would guess, in the range of five. Um, cross country meets, um, we'd be able to start them between 4 and 4.30 at home and, and finish before dark. Um, not a lot of warm up if you're starting at 4 o'clock for a cross country meet. 4.30 would be, you know, ideal. Uh, 5.15 start times for away meets um, are not feasible, especially in some of our uh, sites like Springfield where Forest Park's only available to a certain point. Um, Chicopee, the same thing. Their, their sites are only open until a certain point in the day. So they have about three meets after September 15th, so we do an early release potentially for, 
uh, those three meets for cross country. Um, soccer, varsity and JV home games, no problem. We'd be able to start at 4.15 and, and get both of them in because they can play side by side. Um, varsity and JV away games could start at 5.15 until mid-September and we'd start to run into to a little bit of um, issue with getting those done by, um, by sunset. So potentially an early release of half an hour to maybe an hour for, <coughs> for those games. So in the winter time, I didn't do anything in terms of uh, event uh, impact on events because at Nordic uh, Nordic meets are actually mostly on the weekends. So Nordic practices would be impacted. Um, Nordic meets would not. Um, so I didn't put anything in here in terms of the winter. So I skipped right over to the spring in terms of uh, you know event duration. So baseball on time, softball on time, lacrosse is like soccer, hour and a half, ultimate and tennis on time, outdoor track and field usually between two and three hours um, for a track and field meet. So again, you can see in this case, um, at the beginning of the season, it'll be a little challenging to get those in, but after about the 15th of April, we'd be able to get most, most things in. Um, so you can see again, I broke down how many events occur before April 15th for each of the sports home and away. And so baseball and softball untimed, um, 515 starts for away games would work most of the time. We've actually done several 5 to 515 starts this spring um, for our away games so we could utilize our district transportation um, to save some money. So I know that that does work, um, but it was about April 15th when we were able to do that. Uh, so potentially a couple of early release times for, for those, those events that were before the 15th of April. And of course there's some baseball games that end up just going on and on. Um, but that happens every year either way. So there are always games that have to get stopped due to darkness and made up at other times. Uh, girls lacrosse, as I said earlier, same situation as, as field hockey. So it would be hard to, to continue on with a, a junior varsity program um, without substantial changes um, because of the, the limit of field space and, and the officials. Um, track and field meets, they can start at home for the entire season. There are three away track meets during the season that would potentially need an early release of half an hour to an hour. Um, and then, so the next piece is the, the financial impact. So this spring, as I just mentioned, we were able to save approximately uh, $6,000 in transportation costs by utilizing our district uh, busing rather than our, our private contractor of Five Star. Um, so that was what I was saying. I, I took about 40 events um, this spring and moved them to 5 o'clock starts so we could utilize our, our district transportation leaving at 345. So um, next year, projecting that we could save between 10 and 15,000. Again, that's a projection because I haven't done the, we haven't done the fall and the, and the winter yet, so I haven't asked other athletic directors if they're amenable to, to those times. Um, but they were in the spring. Um, in, in many cases. So these savings wouldn't continue with the 75 minute later start option in FY14. Um, and in addition to that, we would actually have to use uh, Five Star to transport our, our um, girls and boys basketball teams because their games start at 5.30. So they would actually need to leave before our district transportation could leave at 4.45. Um, and that would be the same situation for some of our hockey games as well. So we would have an, uh, you know, a loss of some of the savings that we were able to, to um, make for this spring and, and for next year, um, and an additional little bit with, with basketball and hockey. All right, so finally, um, some of what I presented already includes what some of the athletic directors um, shared in a survey that I sent out. So basically what I asked was, would you be able to host games starting at 5 p.m. or later in the following sports? And I went through all the sports that we offer. Um, and then I asked a question of, would there be you know, positive or negative impacts um, with this switch that we would be making? And I got results back from, if you go to the next slide, Mike. Thanks. I got results back from eight schools, um, four on this slide, four on the next. and. This is a little, 
it's a little messy in this chart, but I tried to take exactly what they put in terms of um, saying yes or no uh, for the individual sports. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the individual things in here. I think what this does show is just the complexity of um, trying to arrange these schedules um, with the, the later start option. Um, so there were some schools that were um, very amenable to, to moving things around, um, and there were some schools that, that said this would be very challenging for us, um, such as the Springfield schools, uh, where in some cases students would have to stay at the school for, for a 515 game um, because they don't have transportation back to the school later and so that would become a challenge for them to hold those students um, in their in their buildings for those uh, two hours yeah, in terms of supervision um, so we had a mix there were some some like I said some ADs that were that were amenable some that said it would be very challenging for them um, and so we saw I heard from Northampton Aguam the Chicopee schools Westfield um, and then um, the Springfield schools which are there are five high schools there um, you can switch to the next one um, Minichog, Ludlow, and Belchertown are the schools that I heard back from. Um, so, and then the final thing I put up was just a couple of positive comments and a couple of, um, you know, not so positive comments coming from the athletic directors um, concerning, you know, more parents being able to attend. It might actually free up some busing for um, some of the schools, give them a little more flexibility with their busing, similar to, to how it helped us this spring. Um, Again, the, the, the inconvenience for some of the city schools and, and students having to stick around after school, um, and then some of the schools utilizing the public parks and, and recreation facilities, it could be kind of challenging for them. Um, so that's a lot of the data that I gathered. There's obviously a lot more, I think, that out there, but um, this is what I was able to put together for, uh, for this point in time. Which is great in a few short weeks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Rich. Mm -hmm. Questions, Debbie? So, yeah, Rich, thank you yep. so much for pulling all this together. It's an enormous amount of work, and I personally really appreciate it. I have just a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. The first is about indoor track, which wasn't mentioned, and, and I do know that they have 330 meets. At least half their meets are 330, so I'm assuming that would also require yeah. early release. Yeah, so that was one of the ones that that I didn't get on to here, <laughs> that I realized afterwards. Um, indoor track, they have six meets. Three of them are at 345, three of them are at seven. They're all at Smith College. Again, it's all PVIAC, so it's not, they're not flexible in terms of those start times. Um, so there would be uh, three potential early release days for, for the indoor track uh, okay. students. Yep. So then my, my second question is, is um, just for Mark, as you know, principal, instructional leader of the high school, do you have any concerns about these students being released early for these events? So I think the <clears throat> um, <clears throat> one of the benefits of Rich drilling down like he did was to go literally sport by sport, season by season, practice by practice, game by game, and and so the the the, the picture that emerges is and he used the he used the average adjective of complex any number of times, and that's that's the that's the lead image that I have. Um, so I'm trying to live in ten in attention right here, which is what I hope we're all trying to do, right? That on one level we've established. And we've asserted that later start time is more consistent with the, with the wellness needs of adolescents, and we're invested in making that happen. And yet, based on Rich's research, there are some competing considerations that also have a fairly high significance as we assess what it is that we do for kids. And so among those two that surface through Rich's analysis are uh, we want them in class. Right? And so the number of times that early release came up as the building principle, it, it's concerning, right? So if it is the case that the later start time, or the later start proposal hinged on that degree of early release time, my recommendation would be that we go back to the drawing board and we try to think about this in a different way, not surrender the goal of, of finding a later start time, 
but finding a way for it not to come at such a dramatic e academic expense. So the second thing, though, is, is and I, I, I'm just, it's worth noting, is that I'm also concerned about participation opportunities, right? So I think we've had any number of conversations about the value that athletics provides in terms of a rounded secondary experience, both middle school and high school, particularly for girls. I mean, everybody's mindful of the, of the ways in which that contributes to adolescent development. And so the, 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 the number of times when I looked at Rich's PowerPoint that JV sports, younger kids, their participation opportunities were compromised, leaves me in the same place of really feeling that tension between having this priority and trying to manage and trying to manage some significant counter counterweights to it. So, so I want to be clear about this. None of what Rich has said has made me want to surrender that commitment, right? Which is why it's defined as attention. And at the same time, what he has unearthed are compelling, and I don't think can be put in the category of those are things we will just work out down the road. They're too compelling in and of, of themselves. So. So God bless Rich for, for kind of laying this out, but as I distill it, those are the, those are the large themes that, that's, that stand out for me. But early release time, I mean, if, if, I'm, if I'm the E period math teacher, right, like I'm on the war path <laughs> against that level. It's just very difficult for me to abide that and still have a, provide a, a coherent academic experience. Thanks. Uh, Michael. Uh, just to get, I'm specific, I think, on two things. One, uh, to confirm in terms of the early release, did I understand that it looked like for the periods where the sun was down and therefore you'd have to do early release, there was no more than six for any particular s one sport? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So there's lots of sports where it's happening, but only if you're playing one sport, you're only been, it's only going to happen six times during the course of the trimester. Is that, that's a correct statement? Correct. Okay. And then in terms of earlier during public comment, there's a percentage in terms of the student body that participates in sports, 42 to whatever. Are you able to break it down by trimester? Um, Historically, it's been very constant. So we're in the mid-400 ranges, and it doesn't vary by trimester. And like over the years, that stayed, uh, has stayed relatively constant. So it's about a third, around a third of the population every, every season. Around 36%, I think. Okay. Yeah. I, I, the reason I ask, I'm just trying to get to the actual human beings that are being impacted. You know. So if you've got a third of the kids who are playing in the fall, and they're playing in a sport where it's, you know, six early releases. You know what those numbers actually are. When you when you can put it all together, it sounds like a huge thing. I think drilling down even further and saying, okay, you know, and that's I wouldn't expect you to do that work, but I think looking at that way mm -hmm. is worthwhile. It's it's. I appreciate the tension because the tension is there. But right. So I think this is. This is a useful uh, conversation to be in. So here's where I went, Michael, to try to drill down even further. So if you took those six days, there's 60 days in the trimester, so that's 10%. That's 10% of the, of the entire class, class number of days that would be, so kids who are sick, kids have college visits, kids have dentist appointments, so there are other more mundane routine things that would contribute to that. But just for athletics, it siphons off six right off the top, and 10% right off the top. So to put it in another context, the, the absence limit is eight, right? If you hit eight in any one trimester, in any one course, you're at risk of losing credit. So six bangs you right up close to that limit without dentist appointments and other garden variety things happen. And can I just ask, don't many students like play lacrosse one semester, hockey the next semester, something the next semester, so that those same students, the ones who are physically active, are the ones missing over and over again. They're not just playing one. We do have a substantial number of multi-sport athletes. I can't give you the no. <laughs> exact number. Thank you so much. This is what I've been wanting for <laughs> since we started this task over a year ago to actually get down to some of the specifics. And anyone who's been following this discussion knows I've been a strong supporter of the goal, but you use the word complex. Mm -hmm. I would use the word daunting to describe this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really tipping the balance in my head because I support the goal of later start times for adolescent mm -hmm. sleep schedules, but I also strongly support athletics and participation in athletics in high school. And right now, I really find this daunting um, for the reasons of participation in athletics and the opportunity to do so at the times that would need to happen, number one. Number two, sports that may not be able to con continue. Three, JV programs that may not be able to continue. Mm -hmm. And then related to sports, four, the athletic considerations that Mark was just talking about. 
Uh, what did I say? I meant to say academic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm finding it I would say daunting and and certainly uh, keeping the goal in mind, but a reconsideration back to the drawing board is something that's very uh, very strong in my mind right now because of this. Because now that we have the specifics, I wouldn't necessarily be so strongly supportive of, of going full speed ahead on this, looking at all it would cost within the athletics and the academic related to the athletics scheduling. So that's how I feel about it. Um, and then I have one simple question that I should probably know the answer to, but I don't. Do we have lights anywhere in any of our fields? Yes, we have lights on uh, alumni field, which is the field inside of the track. And then we have lights on community field, which is our uh, football, baseball, softball facility. Um, but we can't use both sets of lights at the same time, <laughs> the way that they're wired. We can actually only use <laughs> either the community field lights or the alumni <coughs> lights or, or rewire. I mean, there is that possibility with a substantial cost but yes we do have lights on on several fields Any other questions um, so I should probably ask the superintendent and Mark and Mike you know how are you feeling about this now are you still recommending the same thing and this strongly I think that's the email being sent out at you know kind of seeing the the level of detail that rich provided late in the day um, we have not sat down together to talk about this. So I, I guess that's why I brought it to you to say this is new information, much more detailed. We need to go back and we need to have some conversations because part of my conversations will be with um, <coughs> Mark, Rich, and Mike or what, you know, we, we have the information of what sports and I think we also have to have the information of, um, you know, where are we sitting in athletics now? What's the... Uh, potential effect on our budget gap at the moment in terms of athletics and so there's a, a number of different I kind of want to weigh I don't want to say are we cutting anything now but I, I kind of do I want to say are we cutting things that may have an effect a year down the line based on our gap at the moment and I don't know athletics given that we have a fifty to sixty thousand dollar gap for next year does this have any effect for the following year? And I don't know that question, that answer. Um, so I'd like to look at that. And then I really do want to sit down with them and, and say, I think we have some non-negotiables about early release from classrooms. I think we're consistent on that point. Um, and then there's, there's further questions that surround schedule and such that I'd rather take back with these guys to talk about it. It doesn't diminish my commitment to, I think this is a really, um, important move if we can move the start time so that we can help students to have um, less issue with being sleep deprived so my position has not changed on that it's just a matter of um, teasing out what this really means and then putting it back in front of you and saying you know where are we <coughs> gonna fall on this Catherine. Yeah, so, you know, I've been a pretty vocal supporter of um, starting adolescence later at school <coughs> and uh, for all the reasons that I've stated that I think um, as a school district, our number one goal and purpose is to provide an environment that's best for kids to learn in, um, learn academically, although I I also recognize the importance of sports and athletics for students to help them learn other kinds of things and to keep them healthy. And um, Mark, you talked about the last time um, we discussed this about our move towards addressing the needs of the whole child. And um, so I also find what you presented tonight, Rich, uh, incredibly complex um, and I would like a chance to look at it more and and ask some more questions and think about um, maybe some kinds of alternatives uh, because I really don't want to lose the opportunity to provide students not every student but a majority of students um, 
a chance to achieve to their uh, greatest ability, and part of that is not coming to school um, <coughs> tired. And um, the research, I think, really is compelling about that. Um, and again, I've said this before, I understand that this kind of change is incredibly hard, and we have to take all the implications of it very seriously, and which is why I appreciate, Rich, this um, really sort of drilling down, because it does allow us now to look at this information and see, you know, m are there adjustments we can make to the start time? Are there adjustments we can make in, in terms of athletics and when it happens and how it's, you know, um, you know, different days and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, now we really have an opportunity to do that. But I really hope that we don't lose um, uh, sort of the opportunity to um, have an impact on students' achievement and um, in school. So Mike. I just want to say that. Hello? <laughs> okay. Thanks a minute. Uh, so just in response to, to Rick's where we stand now. So if I could write like the, the game plan on how this conversation would have gone over the last year and a half, I would have bet on tonight, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the classic formula for as we look at changes and the things that get us to the end that we can't make the decision to make the change. So I just, I just want to be upfront about that aspect of it. The other things I want us to continue to think about is the forest and not just, just the trees on this, right? So we've considered, we've had many conversations about this over the past year and a half, two years, might even be up to two years now. And sports has been on the table the whole time and a whole variety of things have been on the table at the same time. So a couple of things I want to say. First, focusing on what Rich talked about uh, in terms of his presentation, he set out the doomsday, right? If nothing else changed, this is what would happen, okay? So what I heard is two JV teams would get cut because we can't find a second official. Okay, I don't think we're going to do that. So I think there's that path to look down. The other path to look down is, <coughs> speaking as the middle school principal, I've said from the beginning, if the high school can't come along, the middle school should change too. Put us on the, put us on the elementary school bus runs. There's a lot of things that we made decisions about along the pathway. We've forgotten a little bit about all those decisions. One decision that was made was we weren't going to have kindergarten ki kindergartners be out waiting in the dark in the middle of December, mm -hmm. okay? Because that's the time of the year when that happens. So do we balance that to academics to sports, right? Mm -hmm. So, so my concern, like, is does this just die on the on the backs of looking at the sports programming, or do we continue to have that forced in view? which has to be looking at that whole <coughs> child, looking at, uh, and, and I have to say, I'm compelled by the data. I know there's some disagreeing about that. The research to me is very clear. I hear from a lot of people, both sleep researchers and educational researchers, it's not a debate on that piece, right? We may want to leave that as a debate. It's not a debate. So speaking as a middle school principal, I encourage the school committee to look at ways that the middle school will have a later start time because I watch my kids every morning. Anyone who hasn't spoken yet, Lawrence, you haven't. Uh, I was actually planning on coming tonight and voting against this uh, because I guess I'm one of those persons who I did, I've done what I think is very in-depth research over the last three weekends. And I've looked at the referee journals and the academic research and I don't find it compelling. So what I would love to hear is referee, uh, peer-reviewed research, articles that do show. I'm open to it. I just didn't come across it. That's number one. And then going forward, uh, a very big consideration for me all along asking questions about the survey is the impact that this would have on the families, particularly the families of elementary, but the families in the district. Uh, we made an effort with that, with the survey, and I, and I thank the task force for doing that. But as I've mentioned before, I found the survey very flawed absent the demographic data, and given the structure of the questions, I was, I hate to say it, the, the, the data was uh, 
it, it just didn't figure into my decision because I didn't find it useful. So it would be great if going forward, if we did have an, you know, a scientific, valid, well-crafted survey that, that measured the impact on families in the district. Because actually, athletics has been important to me. I have three daughters who have gone through our excellent program. Uh, but I'm really concerned about the academic improvement, really seeing for me measurable, not subjective, measurable data uh, that shows real academic improvement that situates us in, in the research, as well as uh, a scientific study of how it will impact the families in the community. Anyone else who hasn't spoken yet to us? I just wanted to um, say that we have to recognize that as a region, we're a large region, and that there are students who are waiting at 625 for the bus in the morning, and that's really, really early. Um, and I don't know how you know, that can't contribute to the well-being, even if it was, you know, you know, when I ask people at Amherst, they like, they don't mind the start time, but they don't wait for the bus till 715. So it's really very different when you're out there in the cold and the dark. Um, and I was also wondering how we're going to measure if this is a, a real change on our students, like how we're going to make sure that it really works. And um, if we are going to do something like a later start change where we're, we're taking an hour away from the day for the students, I know Maria mentioned today on the radio about um, looking at the whole picture of our children and talking about homework as well and how they have such an overloaded um, amount already and then that's something that we really need to consider and it's a way to help um, lessen the impact of this. Mm -hmm. But still the sports is really compelling. So. Um, yeah. uh, so I'm just going to say right now, and I know some people might really disagree with this, but I know myself and there are a lot of high schoolers that have come forward and said we are pretty much totally against the 9 o'clock change. Um, I mean, yeah, sleep's really important, but for me, and sports again are, are very important, and I know people are really invested in it and passionate about it. But for me, I think that the way it is now, kids are getting a really kind of, I don't know, full academic experience because you can take college classes. You know, if we push the start time, you wouldn't be able to take college classes. And because, um, you know, the, the sports, if kids would have to get out early, I know for me, like as a teacher, that if I was a teacher, I would hate that for kids to leave. And personally, I don't like leaving class early because I feel like I miss stuff. and. Um, I just know, and I forwarded an email to yes. Maria from a uh, freshman who wrote a, pet, uh, a petition up. And that went to the that, yeah, yeah, you all saw it, but um, just for your information, uh, a freshman emailed me and had a petition that he'd written up saying, you know, all these people who are signing it are against, oops, sorry, against the mm -hmm. later start time. Um, I think, you know, all, the, all these controversies that we're talking about, like with sports, with families, it seems to be working the way it is, and I don't know, just personally, I really don't want to change. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and my mailbox has really exploded this <laughs> week. Um, and one of the things, uh, I think I've stated all my views, I'm not going to state them again. Um, nothing that I've heard, read, seen has changed my opinion. But one thing has dramatically come home to me, given the emails that I've received from proponents and opponents. And that is um, how deeply intrusive this issue is into the lives of families. Um, it touches every single aspect of family life. And we, I, I, I can't support this for a variety of reasons. But whatever we do, I would certainly hope that um, we consider that we're a public school and families <coughs> send their children to us having an expectation that we will respect and honor the public. And I think families make up that. And whatever we do, I hope higher than sports, higher than anything else, we respect the integrity of the lives and rhythms of families. And I think this change, as proposed, really threatens that and undermines that. A lot of talk has been given about costs in terms of dollars and cents. Perfectly valid.
but I'm not sure we found a way to measure other costs that are granted not so easy to measure out, whether it's in terms of increased child care, whether it's in terms of lost wages, whether it's in terms of lost jobs, because some people simply do not have the flexibility that others do to say to their boss, I'm coming in at nine instead of eight. Sure you are. Look for another job. That's the world out there today. Plenty of unemployed people that'll take your job. So I just think we better be very, very careful before we intrude on the very essence of what makes a community what it is, a community, and that's families. I just want to make sure we hit items that were brought up at comment time. One was about data on parents and their jobs, um, whether that would be your Mr. O'Brien okay. addressed that very succinctly, okay. and I, I urge you to follow his suggestion. Okay. Uh, let's see. Anybody? Uh, Debbie, go ahead. So I do support the idea of trying to find a later start time for the middle school and high school students. So it's not that I am completely against change and just can't bring myself to that point. Mm -hmm. I am perfectly prepared, though, tonight to vote against a 9 o'clock start time. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the problems and pitfalls with it very much outweigh the potential benefits. And I think it would be good for us to look at those schools that people keep throwing out there as success stories, which I did. And I looked at all of them that I saw mentioned. Holyoke starts at 8.15. Sharon starts at 8.05. Swampscott, I don't Swampscott, know. Yeah, <laughs> 8.10. Beverly, 8.15. Then outside of Massachusetts, we have Palo Alto, 8.15. Wilton, Connecticut was 820. Someone mentioned Weston, Connecticut, but they start at 745, so I don't see how that's late. <laughs> and then the other one was Minneapolis, which has sort of a, a diverse range of high schools that seem very specialized. The ones that, that push their rigorous curriculum and programs start at 755, the others start at 830. There's not a single one that starts at 9 o'clock. So, uh, you know, I think that's, that's telling, and, and I think it's important that that we recognize that yeah it, it may be a very good ideal and we may s need we n may want to work toward it but nine o'clock is not I, I don't believe nine o'clock is an appropriate time. Um, uh, yeah, I agree with what you said. That what? Oh, sorry. Uh, nine is is very kind of extreme and. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Well, but, okay, so first of all, going back to what Kip was saying, that, you know, families are really concerned, and I agree with that it'll affect families, but I also think it's important to kind of hear what the students are saying. I feel like this discussion isn't based enough on the students, and so many, I've, you know, so many students have come forward and said, don't change it, like, we, it, the way that it is, it's working, and I haven't heard any come up and say, yeah, 9 o'clock, or, you know, um, and that's a big, for me, that's a big effector. And also, you know, as Debbie was saying, um, I'm personally, like, I'm not afraid of change, per se, but I think that at this point, if you look at a rational decision-making model, like, the benefits outweigh the cons for keeping it the way it is, and that's just the more rational choice, I guess. Michael. Uh, so a, f a few things. Um, just for the committee, since I'm new to the committee, um, I've been thinking about this for about four years. We talked about it in Shootsbury. So it's when Northampton first started thinking about it a bunch of years ago. So just so you don't think I've just started thinking about it. Um, and thinking about this meeting, the two things that are compelling for me um, that haven't changed, I'm, I'm in support of it. I mean, clearly there's complexity, but um, I find the research compelling and just, but the two things, one is that we're mandated to look at the whole, you know, so all the kids or the vast majority. And so by definition, kids who are doing other sub, they're subsets, so they're less than the whole. And so for me, I'm thinking about if we're going to create, I think either Catherine or Mark said it last time, creating the, the, the right environment for the best learning. And that's for all the kids. And so for me, that's where I start, you know, and everything else is very valid and there's individual family and, and student concerns, but they're all subsets. And so it breaks out for me in that regard. The other thing I was thinking about more recently is that in terms of choice, and it's not to belittle that people are embracing things and expansive things, but 
if the school says this is when school starts, everyone has to show up. It's legally mandated. You can't, otherwise you're truant. Um, and so, but everything else is a choice, whether you're doing a public school athletic activity, a private athletic activity, uh, an after school component, all of those are choice. But the thing that we would make a decision upon are legally required and people have to show up when we say they have to show up. And that I think is an important framework just to retain. Um, the two other things I just wanted to mention, I mean, it sort of, you know, when Kip was talking about losing jobs, I think it's also important to recognize there will be people and families and students who benefit by a change, whatever the change is, is that I remember when I used to have to wait for the school bus and then run to work. And if it came earlier, it would have been easier for me. So things flip. Everyone's situation is different and there's a gazillion different variations on the theme. So we shouldn't, as Mike said, sort of assume this is just the, the worst case scenario. Other sides will benefit from it. And lastly, just sort of as a, a solution going forward, because this is the other big conversation we're having, is that if the four towns figure out some kind of regionalization as opposed to something else, there is regionalization money. And one of the challenges with the bus schedule is that right now with Union 26, you know, they're separate districts, and so you don't get reimbursed from the state. If we create a region, then we have regionalization money. So there's a little bit more, so we can look at different times. It addresses some of the issues. Clearly, there's logistics to figure out. But if anyone wants to think about how you address, you know, the big issue of learning and stuff, they're married because we get more resources and we have more flexibility in some version of regionalization. That's it. I haven't actually said anything about this so far, so um, I was planning on voting yes tonight if we had a vote, but I think Rob said it best for me is that uh, like, like him, I was for this, but this really seems daunting. I would love it if it was 8.30 and not 9, but we've been down that road and don't feel yet that we can do that. Um, so. You know, uh, that's really where I'm at, I guess. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up and say that I continue to agree with Michael that I find the research compelling. I don't think you're going to find better research or design better research for that. And I also don't think that the biological research can be argued with in the, in the, in the hormonal studies. So I'm still in favor of looking for solutions. However, I think Debbie had some very good points about the actual start times of the districts that we've been comparing ourselves to, and I couldn't help but wonder in places like Minneapolis, St. Paul, which has been held up, or Ann Arbor, which has been held up as areas have done this, I've got to believe that they have, A, more lights than we do for athletics. <laughs> Better electricians. Well, yeah, and, and, B, and B, probably busing not tethered to the elementary school right. busing. I, I just, I'd, I'd be so interested to find out right. if they have a whole bunch of lighted fields and can design their busing to go when they want it to go and not, uh, not constrained to the limitations that we have. Exactly. That has been our, you know, the confounding factor that we started talking about with considering a later start time was do we push everyone back a half an hour but then we have little children home without parents because they have to, again, it's the, the flip side, um, but recognizing even that uh, amount of um, shift would be beneficial to the secondary students. So it is a matter of finances around if we're going to stay connected if we're going to stay connected with our tiers as they are right now, it's it's it has they have to be in sync. However, I appreciate that Michael stated the regionalization conversation, um, you rather than me, because I really feel like that's one of the factors I've been considering. Because Amherst, Pelham, Leverett, and Shutesbury right now do not um, benefit from regional transportation reimbursement, which is a substantial amount of money. Where if we had a region, we would. So Can thank you for raising that. I saw Lawrence's hand. Uh, you oh, no, I was just going to say that okay. uh, one, of the, one of the studies that claimed, uh, the most recent one that a supporter of this sent, uh, that made the comparison with the Air Force Academy. Uh, mm -hmm. If they had looked a little bit closer, the times in the Air Force Academy were 7, 7.30, and 7.50. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, this, this, this is what I've found coming across the research, is that 8 o'clock seems to be the time at which it's, it's sort of the, the flip point or something. Uh, and, and I've, again, to second what Debbie said, it's situating ourselves. When you say later start, well, later than what? Where, where are we starting? Where does the, where does the research take us? Just, and then Mike, you know, and I think I probably said this originally, if I could, you know, wipe the slate clean and have the perfect start time. I love 8.30, um, but again, our circumstance, so I don't know. I just wanted to point out the process in the school committee. The later start time group actually did not recommend mm -hmm. the flip as their first option. They talked about the half an hour shift in time. It was the school committee. Mm -hmm. 
back in, I think this fall or some point, losing my dates on this, I've been doing this a while, is that the school committee said we want you to look into what the effects are to have the switch go to 9 o'clock because looking at the research, the determination was that that's what gives you the maximum benefit. So just playing that back to the school committee, so that's that's what happened, but, but the group that originally worked on it, remember Josh Goldstein saying many, many times, there's no way it's going to be accepted with a with a dramatic shift around a flip and move, which which is or just the flip, and so so he always talked about it should be the half hour shift. So that's what I'm talking about when we step back and look at the forest. Is that there's many things that we made decisions about going down mm -hmm. pathways. Sure. I don't think we should get stuck on this one decision. We need to look continue to look at the wider picture. So I don't. Oh, I'm fine. Yes. Do you have the input you need to? Yeah, <laughs> actually. Um, so my suggestion is we're going we're gonna to go back and have some conversations, and then I will recommend to the committee and talk to Rick as a chair whether we're bringing this back in two weeks or if we're bringing this back in a, in a later date. Um, again, I am committed to exploring all options to make a later shift. However, I've heard clearly from the, the committee questions and um, with the new information from Rich, I think we have more exploring to do. So um, I'm happy to take the information back. Okay, Michael. Um, just two pieces of information maybe if you can look at. I mean, it seems like it's untenable, but if, and maybe it's already there from the early stuff. I appreciate Mike's comments. Um, if everyone went at 8.30, what that would be, it's just nice to have the number. Yes because um, I think that informs future conversations if, if that's supposed to be the ideal. Um, and then I think just the other mm -hmm. thing for the committee, I guess I'm supposed to lean forward into the mic, <laughs> um, for the, the committee is in terms of the timing. You know, my sense was that this conversation and vote was so that we can give students and families a year of adjustment. We can figure out the details. Mm -hmm. So if we put it off for a few months, we're looking at a year and a half or would be willing to look at it for the same start time but have you know an eight month transition time so that's something for us to be thinking about i think between now and then yes. and i would encourage if we if it's doable to sort of keep the same start time and have a short of transition time Andy? i think wasn't it five hundred thousand dollars for the busing if we um did all the busing at the same time if everyone went to school at 8 30 wasn't that that was the estimate by ron okay I i'd want to go back and get more okay specific. all right yeah, Sorry, so, I just so that was the estimate yeah. That was the estimate by Ron, but the um, I, with the new regional contract that that will come up for round busing, or actually regional in all four oh towns God. contract, we we would need to look closely at mm -hmm. all those numbers. So, uh, so and then just one more thing that mm -hmm. hasn't really been brought up is that um, you know looking at the whole. I keep talking about this, I know it's kind of monotonous, but like it's a big part. Um, is the college classes yes. um, because you know you're, you're talking about a, a full learning experience and that mm -hmm. is not just school that is extracurriculars and other worldly worldly experiences and like the big thing about the whole values and beliefs core right. beliefs the whole last part was community and the opportunities of the colleges and like mm -hmm. I don't know that's a huge part for me so I, and I'll, yeah, I'll bring that information back to Zoe. We'll, we'll talk and we'll look at what time that is and, and looking at the different start times, but I will make sure that's not lost. One more, Debbie. So like Zoe, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but <laughs> I personally think when this is, comes back to the committee, it should have the details. And when I say the details, I'm not talking about whose golf is going to play in October versus, I, I just mean the information that people really need to, to make the decision. And I think that's really important because otherwise we just talk around the issues and we just we just don't have all the so and, and, and to Michael's point, I don't I mean I don't think it's bad if it takes a little bit longer and you don't come back until the fall. I, I don't think that would sh shrink the implementation time or expand the implementation time at all. But I, I really as a school committee, this is a really big decision and to me, initially, it felt a little bit like you were asking us to vote on a bottom line budget without giving us any of the details. That's how it felt to me. And we would never do that. And, and so in, in that same regard, we would never vote on a 9 o'clock, I don't think, a 9 o'clock start time without knowing what it entailed. 
Can I just ask one thing? Yeah. Uh, just for the community, I know a lot of times when people don't like something, they'll speak up. But if they're interested, they, they don't say anything. So, they, you know, if the things are going okay or – so whatever your opinion is, please let the school committee know and the superintendent so that we can make an informed decision. Okay. Why don't we wrap this up? Um, move on. Thank, okay. Thanks very much for all your Thank work. You. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so moving on to uh, athletic sponsorship <laughs> advertising. More fun. A double hitter for <laughs> um, So there's a memo in your package uh, dated May 18th uh, from the policy subcommittee to the regional school committee. It asks some questions in this motion. Kip, did you want to address anything on this? Or did you? Um, yeah, this is not unlike the class size matter. Um, We've talked about this in the policy subcommittee um, on several occasions. And we, I guess we felt we, we sort of hit a brick wall because we really didn't have a sense of what the parameters were going to be that we, we should be writing within. Um, and so we brought this back with three questions that we felt were integral and, and, and fundamental to the issue of um, advertising and sponsorship and wanted the committee um, to have a conversation about that in the same way that we'd like the committee to have a conversation about class size. Um, I think that would help us make much better use of our time. I think we could come up with something sooner rather than later if we went, if that was the process. Because um, I personally, and I think other members of the subcommittee, really don't have a clue as to what the sense of, of the committee mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's really essential for bringing something back, even in a draft form. So that's why these two questions were proposed to you. So why don't we zip through these three questions and see what we think. Just, just, yeah. to, just to interject, I mean, I, I appreciate the three questions. I think there's sort of a higher level question that maybe we all, it's, when you say you'd have a, a clue about where the committee is, I think I was struck last time by my statement and then your statement that you were open to pretty much everything and I was more constrictive in that yeah. regard. Yeah. So I think the fundamental question is how open are we to advertising the district, which is not included in these, um, because once you get the sense of how much we let in or not let in, then you can start figuring out where you want to go in terms of where it can be and how much and how you regulate it. Well, that's number one. I isn't think that's it? the intent of number one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is talking about advertising banners and website, which is a subset of the larger concept. No, by banners, I think they don't mean website banners. I think they mean physical banners. Well, e even so, I mean, there's there's the big sense. I mean, your statement was, bring it on. We yeah. want money. <laughs> well, I would. How about we interpret? How about we interpret number one to just mean advertising? Period. Is okay. that what you mean? Yeah, I I I don't want to waste the committee's time in that kind of nitpicking. What we need to know is what are your feelings about advertising? So number no matter where it is, we need to right, know yeah. that. Have some. I, I, we don't expect you to give us the specifics and the details. The guidelines, the regulations can be worked out by Maria. Right. But we need some sense. Let's answer that mm -hmm. question once and for all. And does it take us anywhere else, sort of globally? That would be very helpful. So um, consistent with what I think I'm hearing, I am for, right now, a baby step. Not trying to fashion a global policy around how we sell rooms, how we sell auditoria, how we sell, put a, a brand or a name in order to generate money. I'm not interested in a global policy. I'm interested right now in a baby step. I could see the web. I could see the website as a baby mm -hmm. step. Maybe something physically on, uh, in the gymnasium or out on the, on the play field but again, limited, tasteful, but I'm not so much interested in the policy committee crafting a global policy of how we sell the public space of our public schools. Okay, I'll go next. I'm pretty much for anything. <laughs> I want <really, really laughs> gotcha. as much money gotcha. as I can get. I trust the superintendent to not put up uh, something that's, that's lousy, and so that's where I am. Any, anybody else? Rob? I think it's important to point out that isn't there a policy right now that says no advertising? Correct? There in is. place. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's going to have to be a policy change. We can't do anything without changing that policy. I'm not sure that's correct. Well, it, even if it is, um, the motion tonight could, could overrule that, I suppose. So, but so, so, I, right. I thought there was. I thought we went yeah. over that I thought there initially was. I can look in this website. first part of this discussion. I don't think it's on a Yeah, I don't think there's no. 
Yeah. You'd be able to parse it. Sponsorship. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anybody else? Well, while we looked it up, I, I can I get my opinion? <laughs> Wait, yeah. I, I still oh, have my I, opinion. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I think we need Whether or not we still have a policy. Okay. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I definitely am in favor of signage, specifically in athletic areas, athletic events. I think that's a good idea that a lot of other places do. I have no problem with that. Um, as I said last week, I don't necessarily think it should be the job of the administration of the school committee to start to uh, decide which businesses are okay and which aren't. I think it'd be a good idea to represent local businesses, businesses but not specifically local only businesses. Um, of course, you would think people who wanted to advertise here would be uh, businesses that have a local presence, be they chains or, or mom and pop shops. So I'm in favor of that. and. Um, I forgot what my second point was, so I will use it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I agree with Shabazz as far as um, taking small steps and things like the website, you can walk away from it and you can, when you're not on the site, you don't, you're not constantly being bombarded with the images for whatever they are. And I agree, I know Maria will be tasteful, um, but we need to set up policies that are in place to support the district if you, God forbid, ever leave. Uh, hopefully you don't. <laughs> um, but we need to set up the students to be safe, so I wouldn't want to bombard them. Catherine? Yeah, I um, I agree that um, you know with the idea of signage uh, around athletics and athletic areas and uh, the website, but I I wouldn't just stay to the website because I'm not sure that it would actually bring in enough money to to sort of meet mm. the goal of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to raise money. Um, you know, I uh, probably Rick. I would stop at painting the roof of the middle school, <laughs> but, um, but I do think I do think that um, some local business or locally represented businesses with some banners and signage, of, as we saw examples of, um, makes sense. And we, um, you know, it's clear our athletics could use the money. Debbie. I also agree. I, I think it's. I think we should have a policy that allows the advertising in the gym or at the track at athletic events and the website. And I think we should move forward with it. Michael, um, I like the idea of baby steps. Um, actually, I still have some sound now. Um, and I think supporting athletics. I think that's where it started from. So you know, supporting athletics, and that seems to be a well-established American norm of you know, advertising and banners. Um, the two things I would guess contribute to the conversation that hasn't been said, I actually would not do the website. Um, and for me, it's about captive audiences. So we're expecting parents and students to come to the website to get information. And if we're expecting them to come, and especially, you know, around the portal, you know, anything around that, that's, students have to go for that stuff. And we're asking parents to check on their schedule. So there's a captivity issue that I, you know, is different than an athletic event for me. So I would be less, um, but I think the other thing is just, it, I th maybe it was in the draft ones, it, consistent with um, sort of the wellness policy and healthy living generally, you know, that there's, and you quickly have a slippery slope of who's good and who's bad, but I think we do have a wellness policy. Everyone's required to do it. Um, so, you know, non-violent, non, you know, drugs, non-alcohol. I mean, there's some things you're not allowed to do legally, but I think that vibe and sort of figuring out where the place you can stop, but there's a resonance and a consistency that I think we should try to stick to. Can I just clarify something? Sure. Um, the website's going to have ads on it, whether or not we put them there. So either the site that provides the service will have the ad, or we can pay for the ad ourselves, correct? Yeah. So, yeah. so there's going to be an ad when we get to the portal. That's the whole art, I'm sorry. No, no, it's, it's just, just the whole art schedule. Correct, yes. No. Currently, we're using a program oh, called, okay. yeah, we're using it's a program right. called League Minder. Okay, um, so it's a specifically for athletics. So if you go to the high school website and you click on athletic schedules, mm -hmm. it brings you to digitalsports.com. Okay. So I guess just clarifying that, that if for, for a vendor hosted site, that we can't control that, but for the one that we own, which is the high school or the middle school site, it's a, or the elementary, it's a different one. No, can I further clarify that? Sure, Mr. No. Bice, did you wanna say something? That, that site that they go to, yeah. the, what's it called? Please. Digital sports. Digital com. sports has ads on it that if we want to pay for space on there, we can to have our own ads, or they will put ads there. Oh yeah, no, I got that. Control. Okay. I'm right. just saying that the one that we run, the RPS one, Correct. is, is Correct. separate. We we can't control theirs, but Sorry. we can control ours. Well, just one small point too is it's, it's for those people out there who would like to not be a captive audience to website ads. It's pretty easy to block them on your browser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. steps, so. 
so, cookies. So, oh, sorry. Oh, Mark, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, how about this? <laughs> how about we write the policy and we give it to you? We, we write a draft. I'm dead serious. We write a draft. We've been thinking about this for a while, right? And just to step outside that for a second. So, you know, the, I, I don't want advertising. I'm looking for underwriters, right? I have the NPR model. Remember when NPR had no advertising? <laughs> and it was like this kind of this bastion of purity, unsullied <laughs> by commercialism. NPR has advertising for everybody, right? But it's, but it's quiet. It's not garish, it's not screaming, it's quiet. I'm looking for, and, and they call it, you know, you know, what's that woman's name? Call me and um, I'll help you become an underwriter, of, and, right? What she's telling you is you have to, don't scream, don't do anything gra garish, come in low, right? Then you qualify as an NPR underwriter. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for underwriters. If you, wanna, if you wanna do shocking pink, tout yourself as extreme, I'm not interested. Low NPR-ish kind of model. That's what I'm interested in, right? So what, what I'm also feeling is I get, <coughs> I get Kip, the p position you're in, trying to really parse these issues. I mean, I, I, don't, I would think that'd be a very difficult thing to write. So we're closer right now to kind of stepping out and actually doing it. How about we put together a set of, a set of parameters that seems to approximate that kind of underwriting vision and we give it to you? Because my bottom line is we get $50,000 to make up, right? And so I'm really feeling the urgency to turn the athletic director loose. And I want to earn your trust that we can do this in an understated way that's consistent with the values of the community, that's consistent with the values of the school district. I don't want to trifle with that, because if I trifle with that, I lose your trust, and you'll back me out of this. Right? But I, 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 so I want, to, I want to put something on paper that says, this is how we'll operate. These are the kinds of things we'll solicit. This is the way we'll solicit. This is how it's going to look in the end. So, so maybe you don't have to have another subcommittee meeting for a while, right? So well, uh, next Wednesday. So question number two and the motion kind of address both yeah, those yeah. things. The only difference is the motion doesn't have the part about coming back and getting those guidelines approved at the school committee. So, yeah, um, okay. I, I don't have any problems with that at all, mm -hmm. whatsoever. Um, it really takes a lot of pressure off of us, and you folks are closer to it. Um, we were hoping that we could wrap this up before the end of the year, which I still think is possible. Mm -hmm. right. Our next meeting is May 30th. Can you have something to us by May 30th? I'll, I'll talk to the I'll talk to the athletic director. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure because it'll be spare. It'll, it'll be it'll be no more than one page. Sorry. No, no. Patty, no, the motion. Yes. Yeah, and that, that's I'm trying to trying to encourage that. But, but I'm talking only about a week, Mark. I know. But a, set, a set of very spare bullets for on one one page. That, that's what I'm anticipating. So I, I'm, I'm hearing baby steps. I'm hearing tasteful. I'm hearing consistent with the district, and I'm also hearing money. And so there's some urgency to get going. I, I have a suggestion for they do the guidelines. Come to us at a, the next school committee meeting. Run it by us. We hopefully say okay. But with the idea that that's kind of temporary for now, yeah, and then, then the policy yeah, subcommittee can go and look at it and come up with policies later on. Uh, okay. Just one quick additional item. Uh, I'm wondering, I, I love the idea of underwriter uh, because it kind of removes what I think has a, some negative connotations that advertising, sponsorship, underwriter sort of implies something quite different, a little bit less um, um, threatening. Um, if it's possible to incorporate that concept into whatever you write, that would be helpful for us, I think. Also, is there anything that precludes us from just passing this motion now to authorize it and then still having Mark come back with uh, draft policy guidelines for the policy committee? No, I don't think to answer your question, I don't. Can we change advertising to underwriting? <laughs> so, so, um, so I just reread it. I mean, I read it earlier today. So according to guidelines established by the superintendent or her, or her designee, so the implication is that we're the designee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that's okay. that's, up, that's up to her. <laughs> I'm going to delegate that responsibility. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure where he is, but to the... I would move the motion. I don't know. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> okay. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Michael? Well, just to clarify, I mean, I, I appreciate what Mark's saying, and I think it makes sense if what we're talking about is specifically around the athletic program. Um, I, it seemed like we sort of morphed, and he said, let, let me write it, but it being just focused on athletics. Right. Yes. Um, so I s support that in that regard. I would also say that somewhere in the future, we do have to grapple with this because it's huge. And my two-second mm -hmm. political thing is that 
we're here because we're part of a larger context, which is, you know, we have less tax money because people are paying less taxes, which in, in the end starves public entities like us, which means we have to say, where do we go to the private sector? So it, it's going to get worse, and we have to address it sooner or later because the pressure will continue. Okay, so there's a motion. Any more discussion on the motion? I'm sorry, I didn't hear who seconded. Uh, uh, Debbie. Debbie did. Is it, can I ask a question? Is it possible to add or underwriting, like to ex and or underwriting, like to authorize the athletic director to accept advertising and or underwriting for the athletics program, or is that just semantics? Is that just? Well, you'd semantics. have to do it. You'd have to move to amend, All but right. I think it's kind All of right. it's, it's okay. Yeah, okay. Any more discussion on the motion? Okay, we'll come to a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstaining? I think it was unanimous. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank so I guess I'll move to approve the following gifts. Uh, People's Bank check, People's Bank donation for the Ultimate Invitational, $500. Friends of Amherst Recreation, donation for Weight Room, $1,500. Norman and Eva Brown, Metzer Brown Holocaust Remembrance Scholarship, $500. Pelham After School General Scholarship for 2012, $500. That was Pelham After School Program. In Charter Insurance LLC, General Scholarship for 2011, $1,000. Washington Post Company Matching Gift, High School Choral Program Support, $500, for a total of $4,500. I move that we accept these gifts. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Um, next. Uh, policies. Um, so policy A, B, D, drug-free and alcohol-free workplace and school work, workplace and schools uh, policy. Move to accept. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on that policy? That this is my first read, I believe. This is first read. First read. Uh, in the oh. third, the third paragraph talks about employees, and it seems like we might want to incorporate the concept of volunteers, official volunteers that are on site. Mm -hmm. I have a point of order question. Do we motion a first yeah, we read? Did. So um, we okay. can we can postpone the motion. I think is the wording to the next meeting. Um, but let's let's finish discussion. Well, I guess discussion the motion. Discussing the motion is the same thing as discussing the policy. So you can keep any other discussion on that policy. I don't even know if we have to move to postpone because theoretically we can't pass this anyway even if it's moved because it's first read. It's first read, we're not voting at all. We, we, we usually don't motion a first read even though this was just motioned and seconded. I, mean, I think even if we wanted to vote, it wouldn't be allowed by school committee policy because it is a first read. Right. So, so the motion's out of order. Right? Motion is out of order, correct. Right. So Michael, you, added, you wanted to add the word volunteers? Um, not so much add the word, but add the concept, which should get incorporated, because if someone's volunteering on behalf of the district, whether it's tutoring or whatever, they are under our purview, and therefore we should, they're not an employee, but they're equally important. Okay, so I have a follow-up. If I'm not mistaken, Kip, this was the language, the bold language, is what was added by our legal counsel. Jenny, So should we have to bring that I'll back? Ask. ask. Okay, yeah. that's all I want to uh, And I can ask. Catherine. Um, and, does, and does visitor mm. incorporate a volunteer? As sort of an other mm -hmm. employee, employee, contractor, or visitor. Mm -hmm. That may work right there. I think so. I think so. I'll check to make sure it's okay. specific mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. Visitor also sometimes includes like vendors and things that are on, on yeah. site. Yeah. So, the, but that might be sort yeah. of. Yeah. I'll, I'll check on that. All yeah. encompassing. Yeah. Well, I'm actually thinking about the, the we're putting the responsibility of the employees to do the reporting, and I'm saying volunteers. So if you're tutoring a kid and you see something, oh, you want to add it to the responsibility yes. parties, yeah. Right. Oh, okay. I see. So okay. that's what we still need. To I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other discussion? Is the input button. clear to mm -hmm. Maria? Yes. I just withdraw the motion. And, and well, we. I just ruled it out. Okay. You have the power to do that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So moving on to uh, class size policy. Um, is this first read? Mm -hmm. This is. It's not even first 
Land. It's not interested. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the previous policy caused created more conversation than I thought it would. Uh, I suspect that this one will have a great deal of conversation. This is not a policy. It is just a, an, an exploration of some concepts that we think should be dealt with um, by this group. Um, and it's complicated <coughs> um, by the fact that um, this has ramifications not just for the region, but for Amherst Elementary, Pelham. Um, and so I, need, I think we need some guidance not only on wording, but on the, the, the direction that we should go given three different entities. Do we need three different policies? Um, What's your pleasure? Debbie? So just based on my experience with um, <coughs> Pelham, when I looked through these, the one that immediately caught my eye was Hull's policy, which is really, I think, what operationally Maria does, at least at the elementary yeah. level. I, yes. I, I'm not so sure about the secondary schools. But I like having something in there about the superintendent working with the principals to determine mm. optimal class size. Me too. Mm -hmm. Michael. Um, I like that lead-in. So reflecting on Shootsbury's, um, actually I like Andover's um, for a couple of reasons um, in that I consistently are, am underwhelmed by MASC's policies and I always think they're quite deficient. Um, and so this starts out with, you know, a, a statement of philosophy, um, which I think is helpful. You know, why do we care about class sizes? So that, I think that's helpful. Um, I think having some specific ranges was helpful. Um, some of them had it. And um, I think the only other stuff that I would add in terms of the one that you put forth, Kip, is in the second paragraph, it talks about developing guidelines. And it seems like what we're looking for on an annual basis is some projections. Guidelines should have a lasting power of, of some sort, more than mm -hmm. just an annual. You know, so you're, you're tweaking the projections or something, but the guidelines should be more longstanding. And be explicit, like I think one of the other ones Turk talked about, that we're tying it in part to the budget information. So there's two reporting in that the superintendent does. One's in the spring, which should inform the budget discussion. And then there's one that's in the fall, which is really informational mm -hmm. and it's helpful help planning. So just being more explicit about that. Okay. Um, if I understand you correctly, yeah. um, I, I think we're, we're, we're conscious of that. And we're looking for a range as a guideline to, to avoid the possibility of every time the budget has to get cut or what have you, mm. in particular, you have to rewrite the policy. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a reluctance to go to specific numbers anyway, mm -hmm. um, but I, that's that's what we were thinking about. Yeah, yeah. I was so, just saying, like, the yeah. guideline this year is not 18 to 23, and the guideline next year is 19 to 24. Right. That's not right. Right. doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So I think a policy is to guide practice. And whenever there are exigencies that um, require a, a um, that the policy is, is uh, not feasible, that comes before the committee in a waiver or come, you know, we can look at a waiver without necessarily having to rewrite the policy. But in circumstances where um, there is not an exigency, I think you need to have numbers and not numbers like this Andover for first grade going up to 27. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we specifically had this conversation at the Amherst School Committee. It was before the election, so it was before the new members came on, and we specifically decided that we did not want to have uh, in the policy at the elementary school level guideline numbers written into the policy mm -hmm. for the various reasons that we discussed at the time, that it should be more flexible up to the superintendent. Uh, we talked about having ranges, and we thought that that would be useful, and for that reason, I do prefer the guideline language in the draft policy that KIPP has given us here, much more so than the, uh, than the Andover example policy, um, because it does speak to guidelines and it says that those would be reported to the school committee. Um, now if that instruction of the Amherst School Committee were to change, or if we wanted to revisit the discussion with new members present, then I would think that we would need separate policies, because I don't think it makes sense to have a regional board pick absolute numbers for elementary and secondary school. So. Yeah. Can I just clarify? I mean, I wasn't advocating Andover for specific numbers. I think the idea of a range makes sense, so you build in flexibility. I just like the beginning of the Andover because it's, it's, it's a statement of vision and purpose of why we actually care. Um, th I'm totally fine with the range, and I think if you nail down a number, you're never going to hit that number. So. Well, we were, we just, I'm sorry. Can I, yeah, go ahead. Just to clarify, I mean, we discussed not having, a, when you say range, you mean a range of numbers from this number to that number? Well, it seemed like there were some that were saying, 
you know, we like 18 to 22 or so. I, the thing that Kip put forth didn't have anything, and so I was like, right. how do you hang your hat on that? Well, we don't. And I mean, the Amherst School Committee, when we discussed this, decided that we didn't want even a range of numbers put into a policy because that range could change on a year-to-year -year basis, mm -hmm. and we thought it was uh, made more sense to have that range discussed with the school committee and presented by the superintendent to the school committee, but not be the policy. Maria okay. than me. And I, when we um, when we looked at this topic, you know, I did a fair amount of research of looking at different school districts and what they had, and there's very few policies policies that are actually in place. There's some guidelines which mm -hmm. are not policies, but you know, kind of ranges of people's what people are comfortable with. And we did provide a synopsis of research around optimal class sizes for the elementary level, um, and. We did um, consult with legal as well, and it was very clear that the school committee should not put parameters because it is ultimately the superintendent's decision around class size within an understanding of, um, you know, expectations of the community, therefore the, the school committee. So it was mm -hmm. not to go too specific. Okay. Um, but again, I think some connected to budget was the only place that they really said, if you have to increase um, the budget because of a class size decision, then it would come back in front of the committee. So I think it was a distinction, which I'd be happy to bring back in front of this committee and we can look at again, if that's helpful. So my, my two cents is I actually like the policy, I agree with Rod, I like the policy as it's written here in draft. It's very broad, but what I would love to see is more specificity on when the superintendent brings the numbers to us, what does that look like? So I'd like to see like a five-year history of what the numbers mm -hmm. have been in that report. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see that for the state average and for some districts that we want to compare to. Mm -hmm. so, because too often I think in a lot of reports we get a snapshot and we don't get what the history has been and we sometimes don't get the comparison to other districts. Catherine and Debbie. Yeah, um, I, I agree that I like the guidelines in, 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 this sub, uh, in the policy subcommittees. Um, version and one of the reasons, uh, one of the most important reasons we decided in the Amherst uh, Elementary um, School Committee not to, I mean I was against having a policy period. I, I, I thought that um, given our charge um, as um, in terms of the budget that it was potentially limiting. I mean you don't write a policy if you intend to change it. And so, but I would certainly be supportive of a policy that was, that gave the superintendent and the building administrators the flexibility they needed to, uh, with the understanding, which I trust that they all have, um, of what is best <coughs> for, um, uh, what are the best class sizes for kids to learn. And um, that if it requires going above a number that the superintendent and, and uh, and principals feel is, is too high or there's a budget issue, then it comes to the school committee. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay. um, so again, since we're writing this policy for all of the three districts, um, back to Pelham, I completely understand why in Amherst you might want all of that information, but from the Pelham perspective, it's just not necessary. That You know, the way we have done it, it's it's so small and so specific to the class and the kids in the class and the teachers that we don't need that much information. So again, I think Pelham, we can kind of work around some of this, but I, I, I would be re reluctant if it was written in such a way that I felt like it was kind of placing an undue burden on the superintendent around what was necessary for Pelham. Yeah, I, I wish I had thought um, at the outset of Catherine's point about not having a policy at all, that's maybe where we should have started. Uh, and uh, Maybe that's where we should go, because I don't, I don't know if we talked about having a content to a policy, but maybe the bottom line is we don't want to have one, because that would um, hand, you know, make it difficult for you to make a decision related to budget. I don't know, I'm, but that's a very, very good point. I, I'm sorry I didn't bring it up earlier. Shabazz, Annie, Rob, Michael. So for a little bit of the history that I know, because, for example, one, I don't know any history where we were talking about a policy on class sizes for secondary. 
for me, I always thought the discussion was around elementary. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Number two, a lot of it came up around the discussion yeah. of choice and the presentation that was given around different kinds of enrollments, what the pattern has been looking like. We had very compelling presentation from uh, members of the community with data-driven research, uh, ed economics of education review, journal of education, so on and so forth, that really showed from the community there is interest, particularly in light of when they're seeing documents being circulated, saying that our target population, our target number, uh, class size guidelines for budgetary purposes, target number for kindergarten, first grade, second grade is 22. People were concerned because that's out of line with what the, the research is showing are op is what is optimal at that size. And that's our target size. We're offline from what, from what the data already shows. Now, in truth, we're not at 22. And as the superintendent presented, that was, this was sort of some unfortunate, you know, words that were put here that didn't really reflect like a hard and fast uh, a target that she works with as superintendent to make all of our kindergarten classes and all of our first grade classes and all of our second grade classes, 22 students. So that was a context for why we came at this discussion. And I think it is important that somehow we are saying clearly uh, uh, for our schools that that is not the case and that we have some sort of the optimal number, range, or whatever we're putting in place that shows clear language that that this is what we strive to do, I think is important for the community. Okay. I think especially when we choose uh, whether to be choice or not choice as a district, be it Pelham or as Amherst chooses, um, or at the regional level, that we want to be careful not to pack the classes as full, you know, like Shabazz is saying, you want to make sure, I keep agreeing with you tonight, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, to uh, make sure that we're not just shoving in as many kids as we can in a room, and that, because when it's school choice, it just leaves you that opportunity, like, oh, we could get a little more money. And we don't want to lose mm -hmm. educational benefits for the kids by just stuffing more kids in. Well, uh, yeah, for the reason that Shabazz mentioned, and we've been talking about those numbers for two years since I've been on the committee, I mean, that's why this all came up, is we wanted to get rid of those numbers that nobody mm -hmm. knew where they had come from. So right. for that reason, I support having a policy, but I support having a policy that requires a superintendent to come up with the guidelines and then report them back to the school committee, but doesn't include the guidelines as specific numbers in the policy. So, and I honestly care about that more for elementary, although I can see why middle school might be something you'd want to talk about with teen numbers as well. <laughs> My main focus is elementary, less so for the high school. Middle, I can go either way. Michael and Kathleen. Yeah, I would, I would agree with, I think, what Rob just said, that, you know, hearing the conversation, that being less attached to the numbers, I think, in, in retrospect, you know, we always talk in Chutesbury about the difference between a policy and the guidelines exactly. or the procedures. And so the procedures you're going to develop, and that might have the numbers. Mm -hmm. I think it's essential, and it gets to what Shabazz was talking about, I'll agree with you, too, um, is that it, the policies are about the values. It's the guiding part, you know. So if it comes to the point where you're suggesting 30 kids in a class and we're saying that's not what we're about, that we have to hang our hat on something. And so it's the value statement that says this is what we're trying to do. It's optimal, it's prioritizing educational quality, whatever it is, but that's the policy. And then the specifics, I think, getting to what Rick talked about is that we need some procedural that's very clear about how you report back, when you report back, so that we have the information to ascertain what's appropriate. Catherine? Yeah, I just, I wanted to clarify, um, for Shabazz. Um, Shabazz, I agree. When we discussed those numbers, um, one of the first things we said was the, the use of the word target mm -hmm. um, was, was incorrect. I mean I, I mean, I think we understood that to be a ceiling and certainly not our target, not our target number. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not against a policy, but I just want to be very careful uh, not to lock uh, the superintendent and ourselves into a situation where um, we are going to have budget issues um, uh, because of our policy, serious budget issues. And I, I also wanted to again clarify school choice um, that I don't think anybody here understands school choice to be a way to pack classrooms and make money for the district. I think. One of the advantages of school choice, in fact, for class size 
is that if we have a class that we feel that the superintendent feels and the principal feels is too large, um, school choice actually allows us to make smaller classes. Um, so, but I just I I just want to make sure that that's that that's out there. Um, so you know I I probably would prefer guidelines, but I would certainly be happy to vote f uh, down the road for a general. Uh, philosophical policy or sort of guiding principle. So I, I, um, I think if you go for a general philosophy and we start with elementary um, a policy, I would be happy to write <coughs> guidelines that are more specific with um, ranges, so numbers for the different levels based on the research that we re reviewed, which um, Shabazz mentioned, a few of the uh, different research studies that we took a look at. Um, and then also talk about where in the process are projections, you know, where are you bringing October 1, your actuals, where, when are you actually updating projections for the following year to the committee. So I'd be happy to include that in um, guidelines. Uh, Annie. I just want to ask, can you send, I see some of these, or I can copy them for you maybe, uh, some of yes. those papers that you sent out to Amherst I'd, Powell? I'd be happy to. Thanks. So, have you got me input you want? Um, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I hope so. Um, it's helpful, thank you. Um, Maria, you did mention something a few minutes ago. Yes. About you could make available something. I, I missed what that was. I, I mean, just going by. Oh gosh, it's like no, it was yeah. had to do with numbers, and I, I was wondering if you could supply them to the subcommittee for next. Oh, month. I mean, I did create a yes. document and a yes. recommendation that no, I sent time. out to we Amherst, which I'd be yeah. happy to. Oh, this okay. Here we are. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Never mind. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Kip and everyone else yeah. on the policy subcommittee. You guys, you, <laughs> you really have done so yes. much work. Time out. No, in the past year, really, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's been it's huge, been and yeah. and I just. I want to say I really appreciate well, all the person who really deserves the credit is Elaine. Yes. Yes. She, yes. Is, I know. she has yes. been just outstanding. And I, I, I honestly, I, I can't speak for Lauren. I can't take the credit. She has been just a, a godsend to us. And um, if you're out there, Elaine, um, she, she just was fantastic. I can't say mm -hmm. enough about how much she's contributed. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, second, said, he can't you. take the credit. We'll pass on our <laughs> thanks to her. I will, yes. definitely. Um, which brings up a point, however. Uh, the next meeting we reorganize. And yes. um, right now it's Lawrence, myself, and, and Debbie. And I think, I know, we yeah. could use a third person. Yeah. So you don't have to decide now. Um, but if you could give it some thought and, Rick, you know, when we reorganize, we need to make that decision, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it would be very helpful to have a third body, I think. Yeah. Preferably, um, well, I don't know. Uh, we already have someone from Amherst. We have someone from Leverett. Um, Deb does an excellent job representing central office. That's um, me. I'm not sure where we need a person from, mm -hmm. um, but we, I think it would be helpful to have a third person. And our timeline is um, we just have to wait for Pelham to reorganize, correct? which is in the beginning of, and so by the 12th, we will be set to reorganize here. By your next regional meeting, yes. you can reorganize. Okay, excellent, yes. thank you. We're not Just the last. clarifying. Mm -hmm. We're not the last for the first no, time ever. No, you're not, I know. <laughs> so are we done on policy? Yes. yes. Okay, so moving on to calendars. So the next meeting we do reorganize. Yep. Be, be thinking as Kip said about if you want to be on the policy subcommittee, um, budget subcommittee. Those are the only subcommittees we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, also at the next meeting we'll have an equity update. Mm -hmm. um, we may or may not have discipline update, probably not. That probably will go to an another meeting. Uh, we're gonna also going to have a secondary math update. Uh, yeah. So that will be on there. And I put down retreat prep. Uh, we'll just talk about the agenda for the mm -hmm. retreat, which how can we do goals better? What's the role of uh, school committee versus superintendent, that discussion, and what, how can we come up with a good report card to know if we're doing better or not doing better. Now, related to that last thing, um, I'll, there used to be something called the How Are We Doing Committee on mm -hmm. this committee back in 2009, 2010, and actually did some work on that. And the other ones that came up with these comparison districts that we should compare ourselves to, or they thought we should, and um, they also came up with some criteria for creating a report card. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't didn't get super specific, but it was a list of things. So I'll forward that to you before the next meeting, and do mm -hmm. some thinking about 
you know, what should we be measuring maybe before the next meeting? We could have a little bit of discussion about that before the retreat. Um, and also maybe want to think about reestablishing a committee like that, I don't know, to, to maybe, well, we can't decide on how we're going to do our goals until the retreat, but if we were to decide to have a committee to help with that or to help with, you know, how are we doing, um, maybe we'll, we'll decide to do that. But I guess we won't decide to do that until the retreat, so that's not really for next meeting. <clears throat> anything, anything on the calendar you'd like to see added or? Just confirming the times of the retreat or what? The retreat is 6 to 9. And then remember that for those who want it from 4 to okay. 6 is a school committee training we'll do session. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that mandatory for all new members or all people who haven't been oriented? Yeah, but you don't have to go to this one. There's other you ones. You have to go another okay. if you're not going to okay. take advantage of it. Is it only for regional members, or if there are new Pelham members yes. who Everyone aren't on the region? Yes. For anybody. Anyone. Yeah. Okay, so we need that two hour talk. Okay. Debbie. Uh, Annie, I'm going to send out an email to all Great. the new Thank Pelham you. members, which is everyone but me. <laughs> 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 <You know about it. laughs> so we also, can I also see the other no, um, date we have to think about is the meeting with the select board to hear about the retiree um, questions, which would be on the, what did you say it was? When was that? June 13th. June 13th. 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 Thank you. Yeah. So June 13th. So we'll have to send something out about that. And and Debbie had one. Just reminder for people. Too. I just want to put on your radar. On June 18th, we'll have our retiree years of service awards for staff and faculty. And you're not required to come, but you're certainly invited. It's a really nice night. It'll be at 7 p.m. on the 18th. Where? Oh, sorry. Where? Um, the middle school cafeteria. Well, graduation. Did, did we talk about high school graduation yet? No, that's what I was just going to do too. The A is high school graduation, which typically all school committee members, um, regional members, are sitting up on the stage. So, um, when, is it, when is it? The eighth. Friday. It's Friday, Friday the eighth. And I don't know what time, and I should know what time. It's Six o'clock. Mm -hmm. So we, we get, there's a time we have to be there ahead of time. We go into this green room, blue room, whatever they call that in the background. Um, and then we, we sit up on the stage and it's a, a beautiful thing. So regional members, because we're graduating our seniors, um, we'll be inviting you to join us. And then I get to say wonderful words of wisdom. So. <laughs> so what time should we be there? Um, I will send out a, okay. a specific, okay. no, a specific yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in, um okay. Okay. Yeah, I can't even like. Sorry. <laughs> and we will also send say where you need to go, what time, where you. Yeah. If, you, if you haven't. Uh, confirmation. And we will need confirmation. And you should get that confirmed if you're coming because it's all about the seating and making sure everybody's in order. If you haven't done it, it's really a blast, it's awesome. and it's like makes being on a school committee worth it. <laughs> you, really, your yeah. you, your face first was smiling at the end of yeah. it. It's really wonderful. So we haven't yet reorganized in Pelham, and that's going to happen the day before. I mean, I think I know how it's going to go, yes. but... Would you like uh, me to say that? Um, I just want to make sure that the person gets the invitation. <laughs> the appropriate oh, yes. person yeah. gets No, he will get the invitation. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so... Yeah. I don't know, should I say anything? That's fine. This is I've, I've I've been very open. This is my last meeting. So oh, we want to formally really. thank Debbie because she will be stepping down from regional. I just wanted to be respectful, Debbie. So you know, I want to thank Debbie personally um, mm -hmm. for the time and the energy you've put into the regional school committee, and I feel and have felt a hundred percent supported to by you through this process and um, your voice in terms of asking really wonderful, hard questions, and um, work, but, and working collaboratively with us has been a gift. So um, I want to thank you. And I'm glad I get to keep working with you and tell them. Yeah, th thanks. And I'm glad I get to continue to work collaboratively with you, because this past year has been, it's been a great committee. Mm -hmm. It's been a great experience. I want to thank you, too. It's been just a pleasure working with you. And like in the Budget Subcommittee, she just knows the numbers better than any of us. It's just <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> You've been great. Thank you. We'll miss you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Debbie. Okay. All right. I guess. Rob. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor?
Well, that was, that was okay. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you.